Hi. So tonight, live streaming, maybe a little drunk history, and a whole lot of sewing. Behind me, I have my wrecked pirate flags. Yesterday, I took the uh, on stream one and two. I took the, uh, the skulls and bones off, and now I'm going to make this into a larger flag. And I'm going to make a copy of this as it is in new material. Um, then I have to cut new skulls and bones for this one. And then I have to um, bleach out, if I can, the old skulls and bones. Which, I don't know if the camera will show this color, but you know, it looks white there. There's a pink cast to it that I want to get rid of. Um, but I want to make these whiter and then uh, sew them back onto these smaller flags and put the new and the old one on, the old giant ones, onto this one. And then I have to make new skulls and bones for the new version of that flag. Uh, and I'm not doing all that tonight, but we'll see how far we get. So I've got my work cut out for me and uh, let's get to it. You happen to show up in chat while we're here. I welcome questions and comments and topics of conversation besides uh, how many stitches I'm making. I don't mind talking about that, but it's Saturday night. Let's uh, let's have some fun. So let me just get situated here and make sure that the stream's going okay. Can anybody see it? I think so. Should be. So we're at, uh, hey, nice. All right, great. Let me post this up on. Uh, All right, great. Let me post this up on uh, a couple of places, and we'll see if we can get let's see here, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and maybe we'll get some visitors. Here we go. Post. Watching, apparently welcome in case you missed it quick recap I've got to uh, fix these pirate flags behind me um, they were done and they were beautiful and at the last minute I was just I was ready to ship them they were one of them one I'm keeping but I was ready to, to ship out the ones I owe to somebody and at the last minute I thought you know my original plan was to uh, to make these weathered and look like they've been battle scarred and sailed the high seas, and so I uh, dropped just a, what I thought was a tiny amount of brown dye into the uh, dye bath, and when I took them out, they were pink. And so I tried to rescue them with a thin bleach solution, with a, had a, a trim brush, about two and a half inch paint brush. Tried to bleach them and thought I had rescued them, and I looked at them in the uh, clear light of day, I hung them out on the, uh, the clothesline, and uh, they're just so grayed out that they didn't look like black flags and they didn't do the job. So I'm taking them apart. Last uh, stream yesterday, I took off all of the skulls and bones and I'm uh, rebuilding them now. So uh, I'm going to make a complete new copy of this flag, this vertically oriented one, just like this. With, uh, with It'll be entirely new, new skulls and bones, new uh, background. Uh, this one I'm going to cut apart and add side panels and make it a it more like this one here uh, in, in proportion and uh, then we put it all back together so, so say hi in chat I always welcome uh, conversation while I'm working the main I don't have a show prep or anything like that like, uh, like a professional or radio guy or something like um, because I'm not here really to read I'm here to work but um, but I love talking with people in the chat so I'll say howdy and get to work. Let's see here. Bring up my monitor so I can see if anyone says anything and we'll get to that. Once I get this other phone charged, I can start listening to, uh, I think tonight it's going to be a general history of the pirates, which is a great book uh, written on Darn
during the, during the maybe even the tail end of the Golden Age of Piracy, I think 1728, and uh, reputedly by Daniel Defoe, you know, Robinson Crusoe, and a bunch of other stuff. But there's some controversy about that. I don't know if he's the guy who did it. skittering around in the other room. That's our kitten chasing a, uh, either a Sharpie marker or a foil ball, two of her favorite toys. Let's see here, a general history of the pirates, P-Y-R-A-T-E-S. And I like the, uh, there's a LibriVox version of it that's really, really good. It's part one of two. Yeah, let's go here. I'll let this load. It'll take a while, I think, to buffer. Of course, the ads never seem to need the buffer. The, uh, the videos themselves take a while, though. There we go, skip. Okay, let that buffer. Hey, um, I, actually, I'm typing to you, but I'm, I'm glad to see you, man. Um, I was just thinking about you uh, a couple weeks ago. I finished making a tent, and I thought, you know, I haven't heard from Peter Zach in a while. And uh, we have a tent to make, so I uh, thought maybe we could uh, we should talk about that. Um, but anyway, I'm glad, I'm glad to see you. I guess you, uh, you saw my post over there. Let me send out a note to, uh, I texted a buddy. Yeah, I know, you know, I, I followed your post and I didn't want to bug you back then when I was seeing that stuff. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I hope you've uh, sorted things out. Did you figure out what was going on? I'm guessing yeah, since you're here. So that's the, I'm really glad. Thought it was the end still. You know, everybody I hear who has to deal with the VA has, it seems, and maybe I don't hear from the guys who have, a, have an easy time, but, but I, I hear repeatedly stories about the VA being hard to deal with and hard to get, uh, you know, get, get what, what guys need from them, which doesn't seem to make sense because, you know, I mean, as far as most people think of it, that's kind of part of the deal when you sign up, you know. I got better somehow. I haven't been, ah, okay. You got, well, hey man, if you're better, then you're better. That's, you know, I'll take it, you know. That's out. Let me bring this uh, 
move this up here. So I don't know if you saw my uh, quick intro. I'm rebuilding these uh, pirate flags that I made a couple weeks ago on stream. I have, uh, I have three of them. One of them is vertically oriented. It's, it's for a friend of mine. Um, these other two I made. Um, they were all done. They were beautiful and ready to go out. And then uh, at the last minute, I thought, you know, my original plan was to uh, weather them. And so I tried doing that, and I turned them pink. And then I tried bleaching them to cure that and made them worse. And um, so I'm fixing them. I'm going to have taken them apart. I've got all the skulls and bones off, and I'm going to uh, re-dye these and, and uh, make them how they should look, black flags. And then... Uh, um, uh, and then the one that's going to my friend, uh, I'm going to make a, I'm making a copy of this one new because he liked it that way. Uh, and I, I think what happened partly is, um, I mean, uh, you know, my original plan was to make them weathered, but then I fell in love with them not weathered, and I should have left them there. But you know, I was like, nope, that's the way I was going to do it. I should have, should have stopped while I was ahead. But you know, live and learn. Anyway, this is, uh, here's one of the skulls, so I pulled these off. They don't look pink in here, but they've got a real slight pink cast, so I'm going to see if I can cure that. Is that too low, too high? Yeah, I think it's too low. There we go. Uh, anyhow, so uh, in a minute here, I'm going to drink my coffee for a minute, and then, yeah. So I, I figured this would be a good, uh, I want to make a, when I'm done with these, I'm going to make a video. Uh, I figure, because it happens in every kind of project, whether, you know, it's construction or sewing or anything like that you, you foul something up and then you got to figure out how to fix it so maybe people who don't know how can benefit from my mistakes that's just a little bit here doing a major project what are you working on moving into the video world myself oh do you have a youtube channel or uh, some other kind of video. Not yet. Hmm. What kind of video stuff are you doing? Or thinking of? Neat. Awesome. This is going to be on YouTube or uh, Rumble or where? Do you know? Or Facebook? I guess Twitter now too. X. Uh, they're doing that kind of thing too. I haven't. I haven't tried to do it over there. I don't have a verified, you know, the premium account. But just chilling and relaxing. Yeah. More likely, more likely in the more lively in the Red Little War period. Awesome. <clears throat> I'll definitely have it on my uh, my playlist. Oh, maybe we can do, we'll do a, we can do a collaboration sometime. We'll get together and shoot the breeze. That's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, I mean, my like this. I've just started doing this last month, um, and you know, I've got. I figured I have projects to do, and I like the idea. Of, uh, there are a lot of people who don't know how to do well, just basic sewing and you know, how to sew a button on or how to fix stuff or how to you know, if you want to make a pirate flag, but you don't have any idea how to do it other than to go to the store and get one. So, so I figure I'll, I'll show some of the stuff I'm working on and then in the chat, you know, talk about history or whatever people want to talk about. Um, figure out what platform yet. Um, some of the, some of the guys I watch do, uh, uh, they, they simultaneously go to like, they're on YouTube and rumble and locals and, um, and, and maybe even Twitter and stuff. And I know one of them at least is on Twitter. Um, and they somehow, they broadcast on all of them simultaneously. So you, you can, I think, sign up, for, like, you know, get your account on each of them. And then in some settings, I only know how to do it on YouTube right now. I, I could probably figure it out. I just haven't, 
you know, like I said, I just started doing this last month. Um, and it took me six, uh, six, uh, six live streams before I figured out how to get sound on. So, you know, I'm doing, uh, doing the best I can at it. But, but there's a way uh, somehow to broadcast it to all of them if you wanted. So you could, you know, send it out however you like. I'm addressing Gettysburg. But I don't think I've heard that. Is that on, uh, like, uh, iTunes or something? Is that through Apple? I'm not, I'm not actually familiar with podcasts. I listen to a lot of live streams on, like, on YouTube and stuff like that. Sometimes on Twitch or Twitter. Every once in a while on Twitch. But uh, most, of, most of my uh, media is on... Oh, yeah. You know, Patreon's supposed to be good. Do they, can you broadcast there, or is that just to... Uh, I, I thought Patreon was just for supporting, uh, like you're supporting your channel and stuff. Yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you. I'm just having a smoke. I'm gonna get uh, get to cutting here in a minute. I've got my uh, fabric laid out in there. I'm gonna cut the. Uh, uh, yeah, it just turned free. Oh, cool. Awesome. You know what you're going to call it yet? Free or paid. Oh, like you pay them to broadcast your thing on Patreon? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't actually have a name for this. The muralist one, I started this channel like 15 years ago or something and uh, kind of let it lay dormant for a long time and then just picked it up uh, a little bit last year and then uh, and I got really busy during the year but then um, I think back in November or December I, I decided I wanted to start doing stuff so so I started making shorts and um, turns out it's kind of fun so tense by Greg yeah hey you know that's there's something I don't know how I've thought about that. I called the Department of Taxation to come in Ohio, and I, I called the uh, Department of Taxation because I uh, the guy I was making this for is in Ohio, and I wanted to see if I needed to charge him or collect sales tax on it. And so we had a nice long discussion one morning, and uh, um, I hadn't really thought of it as a business, but um, I don't know of anybody else who does tents like I do. You know, I don't do many, but, um, you know, um, and, and I'm not sure really, there's not, I don't know that there's a, there's a market, but it's a different thing, you know, like the guy who wants, you know, LLC, maybe I ought to look into that. Yeah, I thought about that a little bit, but, you know, like these are all kind of, the stuff I do is all kind of pick up projects, you know, like I have a tent and as soon as I finished the tent, I was talking with, with a buddy of mine and, um, he was talking about some political stuff going on near where he lives, and, and uh, he said something about pirate flags, and he said, oh, man, I've always wanted to make a pirate flag, and he, he went from there. He, he said, he, yeah, you know, there's some guys who do the European ones. Uh, there's some this guy like in Czechoslovakia who does, um, I think they do, like, medieval stuff and Roman, and um, there are a few of them who do linen tents. Um, I don't know that there are any really that... They're as complicated as a uh, common soldier's tent of the revolution, but uh, but there are there are a few people doing them. So maybe I have to think about getting serious about that this year. German paperwork. Oh, the, from the uh, the big book. Oh, 
Oh boy. Um, I'd love to read that sometime. I got to see the book once. So I was at Williamsburg and a guy who has the book there um, brought it out of the vault. He, uh, it, was, it was a precious artifact that he, he dug out. And, I mean, we looked, looked through it. It was, uh, it, it was pretty cool for what little I was able to see. And I don't speak German. Uh, you know, maybe just, I might be able to order a beer in German. That's about it. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd love to see that. think it is time to get to work. So what I'm going to do, <clears throat> let me double check. So I wrote to the, uh, I wrote to the museum. This is one of the last two fire flags that exist. What's this up? Um, this is kind of a copy of it. So I made this thing. We just kind of guessed on the size. I got the proportions from the... There's a photo of one in a museum, I think, in Denmark. Yeah, it was captured in North Africa in the late 18th century. And uh, um, kind of guessed at the size and then just got the proportions from their photograph and worked it out. And only then did I think to... you know, Only after I had made it did I think to write to the museum and ask them how big it was. Well, the lady there wrote me right back and... Uh, and told me it's 90 by 120 centimeters and so I figured that out and so this thing turns out to be within just a few inches of the size of the original the one right behind me um, this one so I'm going to leave these two this size this one my friend wants his like this uh, he wanted it turned on its side and then and to fill it with uh, the skull and bones so it's really visible on its flagpole. pole um, so I'm going to make a copy of that one just as it is, so it's nice and new for him. But I want to take this one apart and then extend it out on the side so it has the same proportion as this. Um, and so I'm going to do a little bit of math here. Um, actually, I already did the thing. I need to make it, I think, it's 48. I want to make it, I think, 64 or so. I'm going to start at least at 64. There it is. 36 and yeah, about 10 and a half. So 36, 40, and yeah, we're going to wind up about 46 inches. So I'm going to start. I need to add, I think, if that's. Um, This is about 33. So if I start at 36, no, 33. I want to get to 64. I want it 64 wide. Uh, 64, 33. 
No, the second one is, it's exactly the same. It's just turned, it's just, the, it's exactly the same. These are the same size. Um, actually, I don't, I don't think you can see my cursor. Both are the same size in, in proportion. Um, the skull and bones in the large one is the same skull and bones that's on here. It's just 150% larger to fill it up. Uh, my friend just wanted, he just wanted it oriented on its side uh, like this. Um, and so I put the reinforcing on this edge rather than along this edge, you see. So it's, it's the same, same flag, same design. Uh, it's just turned because he wanted it. That's what he wanted was just uh, same, same size but maximize the, the skull and bones on it. Um, and since I'm not going to send this to him, I'm going to make him a new one. Um, I'm going to take this one and I'm going to extend it so it has the same proportions as these. So I'm going to add, I want this width to be, I'm going to start out at like 64. It's at 33 now. Um, let me get my calculator. And uh, so I know I could do this in my head, but okay. So at 31, um, so I, I, want, I want to add two pieces at least to start, about 16 inches. Right, you're at 31? Yeah. Say about 16, maybe. I'll cut two pieces at 18 inches and attach them on there and hem them out, and then I'll, I'll adjust it in. Um, but I want this just over five feet, um, or just under five and a half feet wide when it's done. And right now it's, you know, it's not quite, it's 33 inches, you know, just under three. So it's just going to extend it a little bit so it's, it's proportioned like these. Um, and, uh, and that's it. So I'm ready to cut. I'm going to, I'm going to open up the, uh, the door. I've got my fabric in there. Uh, I'll apologize to you guys for the uh, sound quality, but this is the best my mic can do. And I haven't had time to uh, figure out how to... Uh, there, there are filters and settings I can adjust, but I don't know how to do that yet. Um, so let me uh, I'll adjust the camera down so you can see the fascinating world of fabric cutting. You can find a piece of chalk and get to it. Actually, I may need a color. I probably ought to use colored chalk on this when the, uh, the white chalk doesn't really show up very well. Pencil? Where's my other pencil? Alright. So, just down to the... Oh, really? Are they? I've never seen one in person, like a, a, an original. Let me get to cutting, and then uh, once I get sewing, I'll, I'll be sitting here for hours, so and I'm going to get these things cut. Let me take... Uh, this start here. Hey, got a sneaker belt.
gonna start a little bit bigger and I'll pull threads to get it squared off, but this gets me close, you know. Need to leave a seam allowance too for the hems. So I've got my work cut out for me, and then we're ready to get rolling. Let's see here. Now's the exciting part. Pulling threads until I get it squared off.
Hey, hey, Fabrilius. Fabrilius. How's it going, man? Yeah. So I just cut, uh, how do you pronounce that name? Is it Adonium Fabrilis? I just, uh, I just, this is the new reinforcing bit. Let me move the camera here. I'm going to cover it just so you guys don't get seasick. But I'll show you what we're doing. Let me go up a little bit more. Okay. All right. So this piece, when I get it, I'm going to trim it down, but this becomes the reinforcing piece and it gets folded in like that and then stitched down. This is for the new one for you. And then this is the new body of the new flag. And I just made two of these, and they are going to extend. I'm going to add them to the to this to the sides of this one, so that it's proportioned like this. So the skull and bones are going to stay the same on this one, but the flag itself will be proportioned like uh, like that. So it's just going to be, it'll be wired. I think this one's going to turn out really cool. It's going to be, it's going to be big and bold, which will be pretty rad. So between here and there, I've got a lot of threads to pull just to square this off. Where's my seam ripper? Just cutting the selvage off, which is a, it's kind of a, I think it's a byproduct of the weaving process, but it makes a really nice crisp edge that doesn't, un, it doesn't unravel. But I don't want it on here because this gets treated differently. So how are you doing, Adonius? All good. So just start pulling threads <clears throat> and then trimming it, and it just squares it all off. And you know, I know I have a roughly square piece of thread with straight edges, or fabric with straight edges. Sometimes it goes easy like this, and sometimes it's less easy. This is cool photograph of negative shroud, yeah.
that was listening there but can't talk. That's odd. Donnie, this is a mutual friend of ours. He's trying to figure out how to get in to the YouTube thing. So, anyway. All right. All right. I don't really know how to make this more exciting or uh, camera friendly, but this is... This is how the sausage is made. I do this for tents too, so you know, if I start with 16 foot long panels of linen and I'm pulling thread, it seems like for days. It doesn't really take that long, but but I do that on, on those too to get, get the square edge. You know, if you're making something like a shirt, you don't really need to do it, but it helps. At least for sleeves and bodies and things that have straight edges. Put the uh, general history of the pirates on. We can listen to that while we work. If it's too loud or too quiet, let me know. Because it's just playing on my other phone. Please visit LibriVox.com. Let me see if I can get to it. Recording by Barry Eads. Two sloops and John and his comrades, not yet forgetting their former business, made use of their old freedom and took out of them his money and goods. You can be attained when you start getting the regulating. Five hundred pounds. Funky. After this, yeah. they steered away. Hispaniola, not being satisfied whether the governor would admit oh, that he carried on two trades at once, and so thought to have bidden farewell to the Bahamas. It could be a pain in a lot of ways. But as ill luck would have it, they met with a violent tornado wherein they lost their mast. They seem to have a lot of rules, to one and some of them seem kind of arbitrary. And lost their sloop. The men got all ashore and lived up and down. I guess it kind of makes sense, though. I mean, they've got billions of people watching, or billions of views every day. And you know, people of all ages, and backgrounds and stuff, making stuff and watching. With good words and fair so I guess they have to them kind of and brought them all to Providence, being a eleven persons, ten of which were tried in the This actually is pretty straight. I accidentally made a fairly straight cut on this. I think. Might have to trim off half an inch or so, but it's not bad. Using limit words or letters to avoid bots and trolls. Yeah. Um, I haven't had enough people on to uh, troll, and I don't even think I've had any bots. I get a lot of bots on Twitter, um, but um, the only people who've been in, apart from what I think are YouTube, um, when I'm often when I'm when I'm streaming, and there's usually nobody here. Like, you know, every once in a while I'll just do a stream, I won't announce it or anything, and, and I'll get, every once in a while, it'll go from uh, one viewer, which is me usually, because I always have a, oh, does it? Uh, I guess, well, I'm a ways from monetization, I've got, I just picked up a couple, like, three subscribers today, which is pretty nice, um, and thank you, by the way, um, but I need a thousand, and then four thousand hours of watch time, and I've got about... 52 hours of watch time and, you know, I'm away away. My goal for the, by this time next year though, I want it, I want the channel monetized. Um, and that opens up some other possibilities for it too. It lets you do more. Um, okay, so we're getting to the, Almost to the point. Once it once I start getting, I don't know if you can see this fringe. This is incidentally how I make fringe for hunting shirts. Um, but so I'm going to cut that fringe off because once it gets kind of like this, then it gets hard to pull these things out. But already I've got. I mean that's a 
a nice square edge. So just a few minutes of work and you get it get it nice. Cheat and how to so they have to do a how to watch and rewatch. Yeah. What what I want to do with the uh, I actually want to do that with my tent flat with the I did a tent live stream and uh, it's it's up and with this uh, the I did the pirate flag stream and now I'm doing the how to rescue a wrecked project stream. Um, I, I do want to take these um, and condense them down into like a, I don't know five or ten or twenty minutes however long it takes to get just all the basic steps like okay here's how you make a tent here's how to, here's how to measure and figure your sizes and then here's how you know step one. You know, you get your pieces cut out, and then you need to, you know, pull the threads and get them squared up. And then, and you don't need, like in a how-to video, I'll never watch, I don't need to watch a guy do 16 feet of backstitching to understand how to do backstitch, you know. Like, like I can just show, all right, well, here are a few inches of it. Here's how you do it. And and then, like you say, you can re-watch it. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, okay. So I'm just trimming now. I'm going to trim this fringe off just to keep this edge easy to work with. By morning, this is I'm going to have uh, a pile of white thread on the ground here from all this trimming. But if you do, the, it's like any of these steps. So if you do this foundation stuff right, it makes every other part of it easy, easier anyway. You know, you get a better result. I don't have that, but might as well. Son. Bless you. Just got a video editor and just. Oh, you got a video editor? I use, uh, I've been using Blender. It's a, uh, a 3D modeling and animation program, uh, but it turns out it has a built-in video editor, and I use that uh, for about a year now, and, and I like it. It's, uh, it's open source, it doesn't cost anything, and they update it pretty well. Cutting in super fine wool and, yeah. Oh, the, especially, yeah, right, with, I mean, the, it's just, that's precious stuff, you know. Yeah. Okay, so, so I got that trimmed off, now this stuff should come out a little easier and we can get down to a straight line all the way across. And I have to do this on every one of these pieces, but once I've done it, then rolling the hem, you can make a real nice, uh, I don't know if you can see on the flags before, but you know, they all have a really nice, maybe a 3 inch or quarter inch hem on them, so it's pretty tight. I'll have to check that. What's it called again? Adobe Premiere Pro. Yeah, um, go to blender.org. Let me, uh, I'll just type it here. Blender.org, um, and it's uh, it's pretty good. And it's, it's a really powerful um, 3D modeling and rendering and animation app or program. I've even started, geez, for decades now. I've resisted using the word app for programs, but I just got caught. Um, it just just got into my head. Um, but anyway, I, I like that one. There's another one called DaVinci Resolve that I checked out and I didn't end up using it. I think I downloaded it and tried it and then, um, and I already used Blender for modeling and stuff. Um, so I tried that and it turned out I liked it. It's, it's fairly simple. Um, and there are a lot of tutorials out there. Blender's been updated pretty regularly for years and years. Uh, there's a lot of people using it. Um, so, you know, so it gets a lot of support and it's easy to find tutorials on things, which is helpful to me because I, 
I feel kind of clueless sometimes when I start a new using a new program and I don't even know where to start, you know. So it helps having. I mean, there are lots of videos on YouTube and, and on their website. AI voiceovers for narratives, of letters, and documents. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've in the past week or so, I've been watching a lot of uh, videos on like how to do YouTube efficiently and profitably and stuff. There was just I just watched one this afternoon on AI. Um, and I think they mentioned the names of some of the programs. It was on, uh, let me see if I can find it for you. It was on vidIQ's channel. Vid. And the purpose of this video was to, uh, okay, just type, that, if you just copy and paste, I'll paste the title into the search bar. It's six minutes, 45 seconds long. Um, but he talks about how, um, how the uh, you know people are worried about AI destroying YouTube because people are making a lot of channels that are just AI driven and just pumping out a bunch of garbage. Um, uh, he might you know, that might be a good place to start. I I don't remember if he talked about it or maybe one of the other channels talked about like what programs people are using, but it might be mentioned in there. You could skim through it and see it. If that's one, but I, I just listened to that today, um, and his point is, was kind of that it's AI is going to be used. Um, the real danger, people are worried about it, I guess, taking over. But the real danger is to uh, stock photography and video houses. You know, like if that's your business to provide stock photography, well now people who are proficient with these AI programs, they can you know, have a sort of made to order scene. Um, and, you know, stock photography may be going the way of the buggy whip in the next couple of years. Which, except, now that, now that I think about it, I don't know that that's actually true because all the AI stuff bases its modeling off of stock photography and other people's work. Yeah, right, the, the strike, right? I mean, so so that, that'll be good for maybe a couple of years, but then after a while, AI will just be uh, cannibalizing other AI production. And so in maybe a short time, he didn't talk about this there, but this is something I've given a little bit of thought to. Um, you know, AI, I think, just scans other people's artwork, photography and paintings and things, and then generates some kind of new synthetic version based on those things. But but after a while, it, it's gonna it's got to I think cannibalize this you know all, already AI stuff. So maybe we're gonna wind up with the equivalent of um, remember Xerox machines. You know, you get a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox, and after a while, the quality got really degraded. We may wind up with stuff like that where. You get these weird images that don't align with anything in reality or nothing new. You know, cause I think a photographer or a painter is still going to come up with something that nobody's ever seen before in a way that a computer can't. Not that a computer cannot, but in a different way. You know. All right, I think I need to pull this and then trim the fringe again. We're getting squarer. Making some progress here. There's another fringe to pull. But so when you do this, you can really see how far off your like what I thought were straight lines really are. Let's see, so annoying all these new websites. Yep. It, bunch, it starts bunching up when you have too much fringe on there. So, no, I broke. Damn it. Give me the right accents for the 18th century. Once you use an Irish accent. Yeah, you know what? There's a, uh, 
don't know if you've seen this guy's channel on YouTube here. His name is Simon Roper. Um, search for his channel. He's got, uh, he's a, I think he's a linguist in England. Kind of a younger guy. Um, and he's got some videos on the evolution of the English accent and pronunciation over the years, like from, say, the 16th century on. Um, and I know he's got at least one video on what did, what did Americans sound like in the 18th century. Uh, really kind of some cool stuff. I mean, maybe you can... Oh, you know what? Actually, um, like if you wanted to do that, I, I watched a video of this maybe a month or two ago, and he actually said something about doing uh, the possibility of hiring him for uh, voiceover work. Like if you need something read in, in, a, in a certain accent, he can do that. Uh, check, it, check his channel out. It's pretty cool. All right, so. Make sure the cat can get in and out if she wants to. Oh really? Like in uh, in the original accents? It might make more sense. I mean, as it is, it might be kind of like doing something like a Bronx Tale with a Mississippi accent, you know. Maybe it sounds more flowing in the in the original. Hmm. Cool. I'll have to check that out. straight edge here. The test is when I can pull one thread completely all the way across, or in this case three, and it goes from end to end. Nope, not quite. Unless that was cut. We're really close though. Alright, there's the end. Does this go all the way? Yep, all right, finally. So we got one. You know I'm only going to do two on each of these because I have to get the, uh, the height and the length and width right. So I'll do two on each piece. And then, then I've got, then I have to do the actual measurement and get it so that it matches up, especially on this one because I'm aligning it with the, uh, the existing one. I don't want to change the, the center panel on that one. that for that one. That was easy. All right, so there's one. Let me think about this for a moment. So one of these I don't have to do. Well, actually, maybe I will just to keep it like that. Um, maybe 
do a long edge. I'm going to do this long one. to the general history of the pirates for a bit. Let's see. Honor to them not to rise and save them from the ignominious death they were going to suffer. But it was all in vain. They were now Let me know if the uh, audio on this is okay. I don't know how well it sounds world. on And sincerely side. to repent of what wickedness they had done in this. Yes, answered one of them. I do heartily repent. I repent I had not done more mischief and that we did not cut the throats of them that took us. And I am extremely sorry that you ain't all hanged as well as we. So do I, says another, and I, says a third. And then they were all turned off without making any other dying speeches. Turned off, this is a gang, I've heard Hardy this before, this is a gang of pirates being hanged. some friends of his had often said he should die in his shoes, but that he would make them liars, and so kick them off. And thus ended the lives, with their adventures, of those miserable wretches, who may serve as sad examples of the little effect mercy has upon men once abandoned to an evil course of life. Least I be thought severe in my animadversion. So this is, these are, this is, uh, in the West End. I think this is actually a real guy. It's uh, The General History of the Pirates by Charles Johnson, which might have been an alias for Daniel Defoe. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's not... Uh, this is, if you go on, on YouTube, it's uh, LibriVox Audiobooks, L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X. Um, and these are all people who volunteer um, to read. In, like this, this version of the book has half a dozen different readers. Um, and they, they just volunteer to, to read books. And this one happens to be this book about pirates. Or, uh, you know, um, and they have other books, but this is the only one I'm interested in. There's a, I think there's a, a, oh, you know what it was? Thinking about your, uh, if you're, you were looking for somebody to read or like an AI reader. Um, there's a thing, I just saw this video today. There's a guy named Ludwig who's a big, he's kind of a younger guy, uh, like a big uh, YouTube or Twitch guy. Um, and he made a video, he was telling He's, like, he's got millions of subscribers, and, and he wanted to make a test to see if uh, success on YouTube was luck or skill. And so he made, an, uh, made a website that he didn't associate his brand or his name or anything with. Um, made it anonymous, made up a new name, and uh, started this channel. And he wrote a script, did all the things that he knows how to do to make a good video, a popular one. Um, and then one of the things he did was instead of reading the script himself, he hired somebody from Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. And apparently that's a service where, you know, for like you can contract with people for, uh, uh, for small jobs, um, including voiceovers and editing and things like that. But they do all kinds of things, but that's, that's what he used them for. I just saw that today earlier. That, so that may be a possibility if you're looking for um, someone to narrate something for you. But this guy's voice, I agree with you, the guy's voice does sound like it. Yeah, I think this is a real dude. Wherein I shall be as concise as possible and then transcribe some original letters from the governor of Jamaica and an officer of a man of war to the Alcades of Trinidad on the island of Cuba with their answers translated into English and then proceed to the particular histories of the pirates and their crews that have made most noise in the world in our own times. About March 1722, one of our men of war trading upon the coast, viz. the Greyhound Galley, Captain Walron, the said captain invited some of the merchants to dinner, who, with their attendants and friends, came on board to the number of sixteen or eighteen in all. And having concerted measures, about six or eight dined in the cabin, and the rest were waiting on the deck. While the captain and his guests were at dinner, the bosun pipes for the ship's company to dine. Accordingly, the men take their platters, receive their provisions, 
and down they go between decks, leaving only four or five hands besides the Spaniards above, who were immediately dispatched by them, and the hatches laid on the rest. Those in the cabin were as ready as their companions, for they pulled out their pistols and shot the captain, surgeon, and another oh, dead, and grievously wounded the lieutenant. But he getting out of the window upon a side ladder, thereby saved his life, and so they made themselves masters of the ship in an instant. But by accidental good fortune, she was recovered before she was carried off. For Captain Walren, having manned a sloop with thirty hands out of his ship's company, had sent her to windward some days before, also for trade, which the Spaniards knew very well. And just as the action was over, they saw this sloop coming down before they went towards their ship, upon which the Spaniards took about ten thousand pounds in specie, as I am informed, quitted the ship, and went off in their launch unmolested. About the same time, a guard the coast of Puerto Rico, commanded by one Matthew Luke, an Italian, took four English vessels and murdered all the crews. He was taken by the Lanston Man of War in May 1722 and brought to Jamaica, where they were all but seven deservedly hanged. It is likely the Man of War might not have meddled with her, but that she blindly laid the Lanston on board, thinking she had been a merchant ship, who thereupon catched a tartar. Afterwards in Rumingey, there was found a cartridge of powder made up with a piece of an English journal belonging, I believe, to the cream snow, and upon examination, at last, it was discovered that they had taken this vessel and murdered the crew, and one of the Spaniards, when he came to die, confessed that he had killed 20 English men with his own hands. As Jago de la Vega, February 20, a letter from His Excellency Sir Edward Laws, our governor, to the Alcades of Trinidado on Cuba, dated the 26th of January, 1921-22. Gentlemen, the frequent depredations, robberies, and other acts of hostility which have been committed on the king, my royal master's subjects, by a parcel of banditti who pretend to have commissions from you, and in reality are sheltered under your government, is the occasion of my sending the bearer Captain Chamberlain, commander of his majesty's snow Abbey, to demand satisfaction of you for so many notorious robberies which your people have lately committed on the king's subjects of this island, particularly by those traitors Nicholas Brown and Christopher Winter, to whom you have given protection. Such proceedings as these are not only a breach of the law of nations, but must appear to the world of a very extraordinary nature, when considered that the subjects of a prince in amity and friendship with another shall give countenance and encourage such vile practices. I confess I have had long patience and declined using any violent measures to obtain satisfaction, hoping the cessation of arms so happily concluded upon between our respective sovereigns would have put an effectual stop to those disorders, but on the contrary, I now find the port of Trinidad a receptacle to villains of all nations. I do therefore think fit to acquaint you and assure you in the king my master's name that if I do meet with any of your rogues for the future upon the coast of this island, I will order them to be hanged directly without mercy. And I Dang. expect and demand of you to make ample restitution to Captain Chamberlain of all the Negroes which the said Brown and Winter have lately taken off from the north side of this island, and also of such sloops and other effects as they may have taken and robbed of since the cessation of arms, and that you will deliver up to the bearer such English men as are now detained or otherwise remain at Trinidad, and also expect you will hereafter forbear granting any commissions or suffer any such notorious villains to be equipped and fitted out from your port. Otherwise you may depend upon it, those that I can meet with shall be esteemed pirates and treated as such, of which I thought proper to give you notice, and am, etc. Well, that's good sportsmanship. from Mr. Joseph Laws, Lieutenant of His Majesty's ship, Happy Snow, to the Alcaldes of Trinidad. Gentlemen, I am sent by Commodore Vernon, Commander-in-Chief of all His Majesty's ships in the West Indies, to demand in the King Our Majesty's name all the vessels with their effects, etc., and also the Negroes taken from Jamaica since the cessation of arms. Likewise, all Englishmen now detained or otherwise remaining in your port of Trinidad, particularly Nicholas Brown and Christopher Winter, both of them being traitors, pirates, and common enemies to all nations. 
and the said Commodore had ordered me to acquaint you that he is surprised that the subjects of a prince in amity and friendship with another should give countenance to such notorious villains. In expectation of your immediate compliance, I am, gentlemen, off the river Trinidado, February 8, 1720, your humble servant, Joseph Laws. The answer of the Alcaldes of Trinidado to Mr. Laws' letter. Captain Laws, in answer to yours, this serves to acquaint you that neither in this city nor port are there any negroes or vessels which have been taken at your island of Jamaica, nor on that coast, since the cessation of arms, and what vessels have been taken since that time have been for trading in an unlawful commerce on this coast. And as for those English fugitives you mentioned, they are here as other subjects of our Lord the King, being brought voluntarily to our holy Catholic faith, and have received the water of baptism. But if they should prove rogues, and should not comply with their duty, in which they are bound at present, then they shall be chastised according to the ordinances of our King, whom God preserve. And we beg you will weigh anchor as soon as possible, and leave this port and its coast, because upon no account you shall be suffered to trade, or anything else, for hmm. we have resolved not to admit their own. Oh, look, this is an exchange of letters. You. We kiss your hand. Trinidad, February 8, 1722. Signed, Heronimo Dwey Fuentes, Benite Alfonso del Manzano. Mr. Law's reply to the Alcaldes' letter. Gentlemen, your refusing to deliver up the subjects of the king my master is somewhat surprising, it being in a time of peace, and the detaining them consequently against the law of nations. Notwithstanding your trifling pretense, for which you have no foundation but to forge an excuse, to prevent my making any inquiry into the truth of the facts I have alleged in my former, I must tell you my resolutions are to stay on the coast till I have made reprisals. Yeah. And should I meet any vessels belonging to your port, I shall not treat them as the subjects of the crown of Spain, but as pirates, finding that a part of your religion is this place to protect such villains. He's off politely the telling him to go pound sand. Like, get off of our coast. Servant, Joseph Laws. The answer of one of the alcaldes is to Mr. Laws' reply. Captain Laws, you may assure yourself I will never be wanting in the duty of my post. The prisoners that are here are not in prison, but only kept here to be sent to the governor of the Havana. If you, as you say, command at sea, I command on shore. If you treat the Spaniards, you should happen to take as pirates. I will do the same by every one of your people I can take up. I will not be wanting to good manners if you will do the same. I can likewise act the soldier if any occasion should offer that way, for I have very good people here for that purpose. If you pretend anything else, you may execute it on this coast. God preserve you. I kiss your hand. Trinidad. <laughs> He's very politely Lord, telling him to, uh, oh Sign yeah, bring it. <laughs> we can be friends or we can fight. The advice we have you. received from our plantations in America, dated June 9, 1724, gives us the following mm. account, viz. that Captain Jones and the ship John and Mary, on the 5th of the said month, met with, near the Capes of Virginia, a Spanish guard del coast, commanded by one Don Benito, said to be yeah, commissioned exactly. by the governor of Cuba. She was manned with 60 Spaniards, 18 Frenchmen, and 18 English, and had an English captain as well as Spanish. One Richard Holland, who formerly belonged to the Suffolk Man of War, which he deserted at Naples, and took shelter in a convent. He served on board the Spanish fleet under Admiral Camar in the war in the Mediterranean, and after the sensation of arms with Spain, settled with several of his countrymen, Irish, in the Spanish West Indies. This guard del coast made prize of Captain Jones's ship, and kept possession of her from 5th to the 8th, during which time she also took the prudent Hannah of Boston, Thomas Marcel, Master, That's and a great the name for the little top ship, yeah. Theodore Bear, Master, both laden and bound for Virginia. The former they sent away together with three men and the mate, under the command of a Spanish officer and crew, the same day she was taken. The latter they carried off with them, putting the master and all the crew aboard Captain Jones's ship. They plundered Captain Jones's of 36 men slaves, some gold dust, all his clothes, four great guns and small arms, and about 400 gallons of rum, besides his provisions and stores, 
computed in all to 1,500 pounds sterling. End of introduction, part two. Chapter one, part one of the general history of the pirates, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 1, Part 1. None of these bold adventurers were ever so much talked of for a while as Avery. He made as great a noise in the world as Merivice does now, and was looked upon to be a person of as great consequence. He was represented in Europe as one that had raised himself to the dignity of a king, and was likely to be the founder of a new monarchy, having, as it was said, taken immense riches, and married the great mogul's daughter, who was taken in an Indian ship which fell into his hands, and that he had by her many children, living in great royalty and state, that he had built forts, erected magazines, and was master of a stout squadron of ships, manned with able and desperate fellows of all nations, that he gave commissions out in his own name to the captains of his ships and to the commanders of his forts, and was acknowledged by them as their prince. A play was written upon him, called The Successful Pirate, and these accounts obtained such belief that several schemes were offered to the council for fitting out a squadron to take him, while others were for offering him and his companions an act of grace, and inviting them to England with all their treasures, lest his growing greatness might hinder the trade of Europe to the East Indies. Yet all of these were no more than false rumors, and proved by the credulity of some and the humor of others who loved to tell strange things. For, while it was said, he was aspiring at a crown, he won the shilling, and at the same time it was given out, he was in possession of such prodigious wealth in Madagascar. He was starving in a no doubt, but the reader will have a curiosity of knowing what became of this man, and what were the true grounds of so many false reports concerning him. Therefore I shall, in as brief a manner as I can, give his history. He was born in the west of England, near Plymouth, in Devonshire, being bred to the sea. He served as a mate of a merchantman in several trading voyages. It happened before the Peace of Ryswick when there was an alliance betwixt Spain, England, Holland, and etc. against France, that the French and Martinico <coughs> carried on a smuggling okay. trade with Another the Spaniards on the continent of Peru, which by the laws of Spain is not allowed to friends in time of peace. For none but native Spaniards are permitted to traffic in those parts, or set their feet on shore, unless at any time they are brought as prisoners. Wherefore, they constantly keep certain ships cruising along the coast, whom they call the Guarda del Costa, who have the orders to make prizes of all ships they can light up within five leagues of the land. Now the French growing very bold in trade, and the Spaniards being poorly provided with ships, and those they had made of no force, it often fell out that when they light of the French smugglers, they were not strong enough to attack them. Therefore it was resolved in Spain to hire two or three stout foreign ships for their service, which being known at Bristol, some of the merchants of that city fitted out two ships of 30 on guns and 120 hands each, well furnished with provisions and ammunition and all other stores, and the hire being agreed for by some agents of Spain, they were commanded to sail for Corona or the Groin, there to receive their orders and to take on board some Spanish gentlemen who were to go passengers to New Spain. One of these ships, which I take to be called the Duke, Captain Gibson, commander, Avery was first mate, and being a fellow of more cunning than courage, he insinuated himself into the goodwill of several of the boldest fellows on board the other ship, as well as that which he was on board of. Having sounded their inclinations before he opened himself, this pirate was and finding them right for his design, he at length proposed to them to run away with the ship, telling them what great wealth was to be had upon the coasts of India. It was no sooner said than agreed to, 
and they resolved to execute their plot at 10 o'clock the following night. It must be observed, the captain was one of those who are mightily addicted to punch, so that he passed most of his time on shore in some little drinking ordinary. But this day he did not go on shore as usual. However, this did not spoil the design, for he took his usual dose on board, and so got to bed before the hour appointed for the business. The men also who were not privy to the design turned into their hammocks, leaving none upon deck but the conspirators, who indeed were the greatest part of the ship's crew. At the time agreed on, the Duchess's long boat appeared, which Avery hailing in the usual manner was answered by the men in her, Is your drunken boatswain on board? Which was the watchword agreed between them. And Avery replying in the affirmative, the boat came aboard with sixteen stout fellows and joined the company. When our gentry saw that all was clear, they secured the hatches, so went to work. They did not slip the anchor, yeah, right. but waited leisurely, and so put to sea without any disorder or confusion, though there were several ships then lying in the bay, and among them a Dutch frigate of forty guns, the captain of which was offered a great reward to go out after her. But Punch is a wonderful thing. Perhaps would not have been willing to have been served mm -hmm. so himself, could not be prevailed upon to give such usage to another, and so let Mr. Avery pursue his voyage, whither he had a mind to. The captain, who by this time was awakened, either by the motion of the ship or the noise of working the tackles, rung the bell. Avery and two others went into the cabin. The captain, half asleep and in a kind of fright, asked, What was the matter? Avery answered coolly, Nothing. The captain replied, Something's the matter with the ship. Does she drive? What weather is it? Thinking nothing less than it had been a storm, and that the ship was driven from her anchors. No, no, answered Avery. We're at sea, with a fair wind and good weather. No, we've taken your ship. At sea, says the captain. How can that be? Come, says Avery. Don't be in a fright. But put on your clothes, and I'll let you into a secret. <laughs> you must know that I am captain of this ship now, and this is my cabin. Therefore, you must walk out. I am bound to Madagascar with the design of making my own fortune, and that of all the brave fellows who joined with me. The captain, having little recovered his senses, began to apprehend the meeting. However, his fright was as great as before, which Avery perceiving, bade him fear nothing, for, says he, if you have a mind to make one of us, we'll receive you. And if you'll turn sober and mind your business, perhaps in time I may make you one of my lieutenants. If not, That's there's a boat alongside, and you shall be set ashore. The captain was glad to hear this, and therefore accepted his offer, and the whole crew being called up to know who was willing to go on shore with the captain, and who to seek their fortunes with the rest. There were not above five or six men who were willing to quit this enterprise. Wherefore, they were put into the boat with the captain that minute, and made their way to the shore as well as they could. They proceeded on their voyage to Madagascar, but I do not find they took any ships in their way. When they arrived at the northeast part of that island, they found two sloops at anchor, who, upon seeing them, slipped their cables and ran themselves ashore, the men all landing and running into the woods. These were two sloops which the men had run away with from the West Indies, and seeing Avery, they supposed him to be some frigate sent to take them, and therefore not being a force to engage him, they did what they could to save themselves. He guessed where they were and sent some of his men on shore to let them know they were friends and to offer they might join together for their common safety. The sloop's men were well armed and had posted themselves in a wood with sentinels just on the outside to observe whether the ship landed her men to pursue them. And they, observing only two or three men to come towards them without arms, did not oppose them, but having challenged them, and they answering they were friends, they led them to their body, where they delivered their message. At first they apprehended it was a stratagem to decoy them on board, but when the ambassadors offered that the captain himself, and as many of the crew as they should name, would meet them on shore without arms, they believed them to be in earnest, and they soon entered into a confidence with one another. 
those on board going on shore, and some of those on shore going on board. The sloop's men were rejoiced at the new ally, for their vessels were so small that they could not attack a ship of any force, so that hitherto they had not taken any considerable prize. But now they hoped to fly at high game, and Avery was as well pleased at this reinforcement to strengthen them for any brave enterprise. And though the booty must be lessened to each, being divided into so many shares, and yet he found out an expedient not to suffer by it himself, as shall be shown in its place. Having consulted what was to be done, they resolved to sail out together upon a cruise, the galley and two sloops. They therefore fell to work to get the sloops off, which they soon effected and steered towards the Arabian coast. Near the river Indus, the man at the masthead spied a sail, upon which they gave chase, and as they came nearer to her, they perceived her to be a tall ship, and fancied she might be a Dutch East Indiaman, homeward bound. But she proved to be a better prize. When they fired at her to bring to, she hoisted Mogul's colors, and seemed to stand upon her defense. Avery only cannonaded at a distance, and some of his men began to suspect that he was not the hero they took him for. However, the sloops made use of their time, and coming one on the bow and the other on the quarter of the ship, clapped her on board and entered her, upon which she immediately struck her colors and yielded. She was one of the great Mogul's own ships, and there were in her several of the greatest persons of his court, among whom, it was said, was one of his daughters, who were going on a pilgrimage to Mecca. Spoiler alert, and this is a terrible mistake on Avery's part. ...once in their lives to visit that place, and they were carrying with them rich offerings to present at the shrine of Muhammad. It is known that the eastern people travel with the utmost magnificence, so they had with them all their slaves and attendants, their rich habits and jewels, with vessels of gold and silver, and great sums of money, to defray the charge of their journey by land. Wherefore the plunder got by this prize is not easily computed. Having taken all the treasure on board their own ship, and plundered their prize of everything else they either wanted or liked, they let her go. She, not being able to continue her voyage, returned back. As soon as the news came to the mogul, and he knew that they were English who robbed them, he threatened loud and talked of sending a mighty army with fire and sword to extirpate the English from all their settlements on the Indian coast. The East India Company in England were very much alarmed at it, however. By degrees, they found means to pacify him by promising to do their endeavors to take the robbers and deliver them into his hands. However, the great noise this thing made in Europe, as well as India, was the occasion of all these romantic stories which were formed of Avery's greatness. In the meantime, our successful plunderers agreed to make the best of their way back to Madagascar, intending to make that place their magazine of repository for all their treasure, and to build a small fortification there, and leave a few hands always ashore to look after it, and defend it from any attempts of the natives. But Avery put an end to this project, and made it altogether unnecessary. As they were steering their course, as has been said, he sends a boat on board of each of the sloops, desiring the chief of them to come on board of him in order to hold a council. They did so, and he told them that he had something to propose to them this guy's for the such common a good, which was to provide against accidents. He bade them consider the treasure they were possessed of would be sufficient for them all if they could secure it someplace on shore. Therefore, all they had to fear was some misfortune in the voyage. He bade them consider the consequences of being separated by bad weather, in which case the sloops, if either of them should fall in with any ship of force, must be either taken or sunk, and the treasure on board her lost to the rest. Beside the common accidents of the sea, as for his part, he was so strong, he was able to make his party good with any ship they were like to meet in those seas, that if he met with any ship of such strength, that he could not take her, he was safe from being taken, being so well manned. Beside his ship was a quick sailor, and could carry sail when the sloops could not. Wherefore, he proposed to them to put the treasure on board his ship, to seal up each chest with three seals, 
whereof each was to keep one, and to appoint a rendezvous in case of separation. Upon considering this proposal, it appeared so sensible to them that they readily came into it, for they argued to themselves that an accident might happen to one of the sloops and the other escape. Wherefore, it was for the common good. The thing was done as agreed to, the treasure put on board of Avery, and the chests sealed. They kept company that day and the next, the weather being fair, in which time Avery tampered with his men, telling them they now had sufficient to make all easy, and what should hinder them from going to some country where they were not known, and living on shore all the rest of their days in plenty. They understood what he meant, and in short, they all agreed to bilk their new allies, the sloop's men. Nor do I find that any of them felt any qualms of honor rising in his stomach, to hinder them from consenting to this piece of treachery. In fine, they took advantage of the darkness that night, and steered another course, and by morning, lost sight of them. I leave the reader to judge what swearing and confusion there was among the sloop's men in the morning, when they saw that Avery had given them the slip, for they knew by the fairness of the weather, and the course they had agreed to steer, that it must have been done on purpose. But we leave them at the present to follow Mr. Avery. End of chapter 1, part 1. Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas. Chapter 1, Part 2 of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 1, Part 2. Avery and his men, having consulted what to do with themselves, came to a resolution to make the best of their way towards America, and none of them being known in those parts, they intended to divide the treasure, to change their names, to go ashore, some in one place, some in other, to purchase some settlements, and live at ease. The first land they made was the island of Providence, then newly settled. Here they stayed some time, and having considered that when they should go to New England, the greatness of their ship would cause much inquiry about them, and possibly some people from England, who had heard the story of the ships being run away with from the groin, might suspect them to be the people. They therefore took a resolution of disposing of their ship at Providence, upon which Avery, pretending that the ship being fitted out upon the privateering account, and having no success, had received orders from the owners to dispose of her to the best advantage. He soon met with a purchaser, and immediately bought a sloop. In this sloop he and his companions embarked. They touched at several parts of America, where no person suspected them, and some of them went on shore, and dispersed themselves about the country, having received such dividends as Avery would give them. For he concealed the greatest part of the diamonds from them, which in the first hurry of plundering the ship, they did not much regard as not knowing their value. At length he came to Boston in New England, and seemed to have a desire of settling in those parts, and some of his companions went on shore there also. But he changed his resolution, and proposed to the few of his companions who were left to sail for Ireland, which they consented to. He found out that New England was not a proper place for him, because a great deal of his wealth lay in diamonds, and should he have produced them there, he would have certainly been seized on suspicion of piracy. In their voyage to Ireland, they avoided St. George's Channel, and sailing north about, they put into one of the northern ports of that kingdom. There they disposed of their sloop, and coming on shore, they separated themselves, some going to Cork, and some to Dublin, eighteen of whom obtained their pardons afterwards of K. William. When Avery had remained some time in this kingdom, he was afraid to offer his diamonds to sale, lest an inquiry into his manner of coming by them should occasion a discovery. Therefore, 
while considering with himself what was best to be done, he fancied there were some persons at Bristol who he might venture to trust, upon which he resolved to pass over into England. He did so, and going into Devonshire, he sent to one of these friends to make him these trimmed a town up and, uh, ready to start selling off. When he had communicated okay. himself to his Maybe friends more piece. and consulted more? with him about the means of his effects, one they more agreed to that the safest This is a reinforcing band that goes on the, the side there some where the, there's a, a, a rope well that passes through that and attaches to the uh, flyer. would be made <laughs> how they came by first. them. This friend telling him he was very intimate with some who were very fit for the purpose. And if he would but allow them a good commission, would do the business. Since they could not go on a cruising the last bit here, which is the reinforcing band. It was time band. to think of establishing themselves get the stitching. To which purpose they took all things out of the sloops and made tents of the sails okay. and encamped themselves, having a large quantity of ammunition and abundance of small arms. Here they met with several of their countrymen, the crew of a privateer sloop, which was commanded by Captain Thomas II. And since it will be but a short digression, we will now give an account of how they came here. Captain George Dew and Captain Thomas II having received commissions from then governor of Bermudas to sail directly for the river Gambia in Africa. There, with the advice and assistance of the agents of the Royal African Company, to attempt the taking of the French factory at Gori, lying upon that coast. In a few days after they had sailed out, due in a violent storm, not only sprung his mast, but lost sight of his consort. Due therefore returned back to refit, and two, instead of proceeding on his voyage, made for the Cape of Good Hope, and doubling the said Cape, shaped his course for the Straits of Babel Mandel, being the entrance into the Red Sea. Here he came up with a large ship, richly laden, bound from the Indies to Arabia, with three hundred soldiers on board, besides the seamen. Yet two had the hardiness to board her, and soon carried her, and, tis said by this prize, his men shared nearly 3,000 pounds apiece. Jeez. They had intelligence from the prisoners. That's the part of the to read about. ships to pass that way, well, which two would have attacked, though 3, they were very strong pounds. if they had not been overruled by the quartermaster and others. This differing of opinion created mm -hmm. some ill blood amongst them, so that they resolved to break up pirating and no place was so fit to receive them as Madagascar. Hither they steered, resolving to live on shore and enjoy what they got. As for to himself, he with a few others in a short time went off to Rhode Island, from whence he made his peace. Thus we have accounted for the company of our pirates met with here. It must be observed that the natives of Madagascar are a kind of Negroes. They differ from those of Guinea in their hair which is long, and their complexion is not so good a jet. They have innumerable little princes among them, who are continually making war upon one another. Their prisoners are their slaves, and they either sell them, or put them to death, as they please. When our pirates first settled amongst them, the alliance was much courted by these princes, so they sometimes joined one, sometimes another. But wheresoever they sided, they were sure to be victorious, for the Negroes here had no firearms, nor did they understand their use, so that at length these pirates became so terrible to the Negroes that if two or three of them were only seen on one side, when they were going to engage, the opposite side would fly without striking a blow. By these means they not only became feared but powerful. All the prisoners of war they took to be their slaves. They married oh the most gosh, beautiful really? of wow. the Negro women. Not one or two, but as many of them as they liked, so that every one of them had. As well, I guess they can believe that if you look at some of the court the suits and stuff with gold thread and, and silver, uh, silver Their thread. Slaves they employed in planting and rice, embroidery, and fishing, and hunting, and etc. Silks and stuff. Besides which, they had a three thousand dollars a man they shared out were, on their, under their protection. That, that must have just been an be unimaginable the fortune for most of these guys. Of their powerful neighbors, they seem to pay them a willing homage. Now they began to divide from one another, each living with his own wives, slaves, and dependents, like a separate prince. And as power and plenty naturally beget contention, 
They sometimes quarreled with one another right. and yeah. attacked each other at the head of their several armies. And in these civil That's the one thing I was surprised to uh, to learn is, is how uh, how valuable uh, fabric and, and cloth was. Um, and, and I never really thought about it. I always imagined when I was a kid, you know, I always imagined pirates are, you know, they're just after gold, but but you can sell cloth and then you've laundered the money. You know, like you'd sell calicos and, and you know, wool and stuff at just about any port. And then they've got clean money and they've, uh, they've got their fortune and they can go live however they want. Except so many of these guys, now, this book, a, a lot of it is, it's kind of a morality tale. You know, he, he points out how, uh, how a lot of these guys come to bad ends because of their depravity. Um, so, you know, and maybe we just never hear about the ones who got away with it. So that when the Negroes approached them, they found them all up in arms. Wherefore, they retired without making any attempt. The escape made them very cautious from that time. And it will be worthwhile to describe the policy of these British fellows and to show what measures they took to secure themselves. Yeah. They found that fear of their power could not secure them against the surprise. And the bravest man may be killed when he is asleep by one much as inferior in courage and strength. Therefore, as their first security, they did all they could to form at war betwixt the neighboring Negroes, remaining neuter themselves. By which means, those who were overcome constantly fled to them for protection. Otherwise, they must be either killed or made slaves. The diligence. They strengthened I'll have to their check that out. I've never heard of it. tied some to them by interest. When there was no war, they contrived to spirit up private quarrels among them, and upon every little dispute or misunderstanding, push on one side or the other to revenge. Instruct them how to attack or surprise their adversaries, and lend them loaded pistols or firelocks to dispatch them with. The consequence of which was that the murderer was forced to fly to them for safety of his life with his wives, children, and kindred. Such as these were fast friends, and their lives depended upon the safety of his protectors. For as we observed before, our pirates were grown so terrible that none of their neighbors had resolution enough to attack them in an open war. By such arts as these, in the space of a few years, their body was greatly it's increased. Which is cool, no they yeah. then began to separate themselves and remove at a greater distance from one another for the convenience of more ground, and were divided like Jews into tribes, each carrying with him his wives and children, of which by this time they had a large family, and also their quota of dependents and followers, and if power and command be the thing which distinguish a prince, these ruffians had all the marks of royalty about them, nay more, they had the very fears which commonly disturb tyrants as may be seen by the extreme caution they took in fortifying the places where they dwelt. In this plan of fortification, they imitated one another. Their dwellings were rather citadels than houses. They made choice of a place overgrown with wood. you got to admit, this sounds like a pretty good life, you know, a compared to living in some hovel in so straight and high and that it was impossible to yeah, climb it, especially paradise. Those who had not the use of scaling ladders. Over the stage, the there was one passage into the wood, kind of doing what they and want. the dwelling, which was a hut, was built in the middle of the wood, wood, which the prince who inhabited it thought fit, but so covered that it could not be seen till you came at it. But the greatest cunning lay in the passage which led to the hut, which was so narrow that no more than one person could go abreast, and contrived in such an intricate manner that it was a perfect maze or labyrinth. It made round and round with several little crossways, so that a person that was not well acquainted with the way might walk several hours round and cross these ways without being able to find the hut. Moreover, all along the sides of these narrow paths, certain large thorns which grew upon a tree in that country were struck into the ground with their points uppermost, and the path itself being made crooked at certain time, if a man should attempt to come near the hut at night, he would certainly have struck upon these thorns, though he had been provided with that clue, which 
which Ariadne gave to Theseus when he entered the cave of the Minotaur. Thus tyrant like they lived, fearing and feared by all. I like how he worked in Greek mythology because he knows his reader is going watchers. to understand it. When he went to Madagascar in the Delicia, a ship of 40 guns, with the design of buying slaves in order to sell to the Dutch at Batavia or New Holland. He happened to touch upon a part of the island where no ship had been seen for seven or eight years before, when he met with some of the pirates, at which time they had been upon the island above 25 years, having a large motley generation of children and grandchildren descended from them, there being about that time 11 of them remaining alive. Upon their first seeing a ship of this force and burthen, they supposed it to be a man of war sent to take them. Therefore they lurked within their fastness. But when some from the ship came ashore without any show of hostility and offering to trade with the Negroes, they ventured to come out of their holes, attended like princes, since they actually are kings de facto, which is a kind of right. We ought to speak of them as such. Having been so many years upon this island, it may be imagined their clothes had long been worn out, so that their majesties were extremely out at the elbows. I cannot what a say great they phrase. were ragged, since they had no clothes. They had nothing to cover them, but with the skins of beasts, without any tanning, but with all the hair on, nor a shoe, nor stocking. So they looked like the picture of Hercules in the lion's skin. City of Vice? And being overgrown Nine with beard and hair upon their bodies. Voice. Oh, really? Okay. They the most savage figures that a man's imagination can frame. Let's see if I can find it here. However, they soon got rigged, for they sold great numbers of those poor people under them for clothes, knives, saws, powder and ball, and many other things, and became so familiar that they went aboard the Delicia and were observed to be very curious, examining <clears throat> the inside of the ship, and very familiar with the men, oh, yeah. and okay. them ashore. Their design in doing this, as they had to work he was the uh, was emperor in Star Wars, was wasn't he? practical to surprise the ship in the night, which they judged very easy in case there was but a slender watch kept on board, they having boats and men enough at command. But it seems the captain was aware of them and kept so strong a watch upon deck that they found it was in vain to make any attempt. Wherefore, when some of the men went ashore, they were for inviggling them and drawing them into a plot, for seizing the captain and securing the rest of the men under the hatches, when they should have the night watch, which, uh, which description? promising a signal to come on board to join them, proposing, if they succeeded, to go a pirating together, not doubting, but with that ship, they should be able to take anything they met on the sea. But the captain, observing an intimacy growing betwixt them and some of his men, thought it could be for no good, and therefore he broke it off in time, not suffering them so much as to talk together. And when he sent a boat on shore with an officer to treat with them about the sale of slaves, the crew remained on board the boat, and no man was suffered to talk with them, but the person deputed by him for that purpose. Before he sailed away, and they found that nothing was to be done, they confessed all the designs they had formed against him. Thus he left them as he found them, in a great deal of dirty state and royalty, oh, really? but with fewer subjects than they had, having, as we observed, sold many of them. And if ambition be the darling passion of men, no doubt they were happy. One of these great princes had formerly been a waterman <clears throat> upon the Thames. I've never gotten to go to Fort, uh, Fort Frederick Market for we, uh, we were going years ago. We were literally in the driveway putting the lat like closing the back of our truck. We had just put our tent and all our gear in, everything, we were all ready to go, and I got a call that my uh, my grandfather was dying, and so we drove, we unloaded that stuff and quickly packed a suitcase of modern stuff and drove uh, drove west. So that was our one time when we were planning to go, and uh, never, uh, never got to go. Uh, everybody I've ever talked to has been, said they, uh, they had a good time, it was a great Chapter great place to get great stuff, pirates. and they always had fun, but this is a LibriVox I missed it. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Turretson. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson. Chapter 2 of Captain Martell and His Crew. I come now to the pirates that have rose since the Peace of Utrecht. In wartime, there is no room for any because all those of a roving, adventurous disposition find employment in privateers, so there is no opportunity for pirates. Like our mobs in London, when they come to any height, they appear to order out the yeah, train thing. I mean, it ended up like and our whole family was there and it ended up being impressed, of course. as good as that can ever I be. I take the reason but, of it to be that uh, the mob go we into the tame army. Uh, and immediately from notorious breakers of the I, I vividly remember the having the uh, by being put into just, order solemn we were packed like ready to pull out of the driveway and I got the call put some of the pirates into authority it would not only lessen their number but I imagine okay, this them one upon is the rest, ready to go they would be the this, you know what though I can, find them out according I can measure to the this proverb, and put it down set a thief to catch a thief to bring this about, thought. there needs no other encouragement but to give all the effects to yeah, the board yeah. of pirate vessels. Yeah, and usually if I'm, if I'm buying something for a project, I, I kind of know what I need. And, you know, like for a tent, I know where to get the linen that I want and the, uh, the twine. And, you know, I mean, I mean, beeswax is beeswax, but, um, you know, or if I'm making a coat, you know, you know I'll get the wool. I'm going to take a break from it. Um, you know. Get get the wool or whatever I need to make stuff, but um, the trade fairs are. I've always found them fun for stuff like uh, I don't know, just the kind of stuff that that I don't think about that, that's just kind of fun to have. Like we found a, we were at uh, uh, what do you call it? What's the one in uh, Springfield? George Rogers Clark Park. A uh, fair at New Boston, big, basically a trade fair weekend um, here in Ohio, and uh, like we we've, we've got good center seam wool blankets, and there was a, a couple there who had um, they had tallow candles, like lots of them, and at a really good price. They had, I guess they they had bought out um, like a church. I, I think this, it was something like like this church had ordered. I don't know, a thousand or thousands of these can tallow candles, um, but they were the wrong size for their candelabra, and so they, you know, these guys, you know, this guy and his wife bought them, and you know, so we, we used to get good candles cheap. And Carlisle. Uh, oh yeah, I didn't know. The, isn't that where the War College is, Carlisle? I've driven by there a couple of times. Oh, it's some more natural 18th century stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to know what you're getting. Um, but they're they're you know, it's, it's nice to pick up flints and stuff like that if you if you need things. But we got yeah, fair New Boston. We found we we found blankets and candles. I think probably like a musket tool or yeah, you know, it's just those little little things that, that you don't always think about, and then and then you get out to camp and you're like, oh, gee, what do I do? You know, I'm missing this or that. But but if I'm doing a project, I usually go find the source, and you know, if I'm buying cloth or fabric, I'll get that from you know one of the one of the places I get those. Um, but but for the little stuff, it's it's fun to fun to go see those. <clears throat> This is the, uh, this part actually is the best description of why piracy exploded that, that I've ever heard or read. He, and he's talking about the, uh, the peace of Utrecht. So Europe's at war and then all of a sudden all these, uh, sailors are out of work. And during war, he said there, there's no, uh, 
there's no room for pirates because all, anybody who, who wants to fight at sea goes aboard a privateer, so they're doing it legally. But then, you know, peace breaks out all over Europe, and so trade can explode, but at the same time, then you have all these unemployed sailors who, who, want to, who like to fight and, and like money. And so, uh, so piracy just exploded all over the place for, I don't know, I guess it was about 40 years. Rifles galore, yeah. If you're in the market for a gun, that would be a good place to get it, or a rifle would be a good place to, to get one. Um, there's a guy who sets up a, uh, who sets up a, a rifle, uh, a rifling machine, you know, a wooden one, you know, it's like a big screw uh, machinery device that he built, um, and he does that. And some of my friends here in, uh, in Southern Ohio uh, built one. My friend Joe built one, and they they demonstrate those sometimes. Um, but there there is a there, every once in a while at a, at a show we'll get to you get to see trades like that. You know, like you know, a guy will be out there working on his rifle, you know, rifling a barrel or you know something like that. It's cool. They, they don't have or they do the YouTube has in the chat there's the like this icon that sits over the end of what you said so I can't read the last uh, that word so, uh, to shoot the SP and then there's a big heart or emoji box there that's in the way of reading let me just, let me just type that there to shoot, oh shoot spec ammo um So the reproductions don't. Reproduction ammo doesn't have the right. Yeah. All these uh, all these websites put so many doodads all over the place and distracts me. I liked it when the internet was when nobody knew how to how to write HTML and so everything was very crude and simple and just big boxes of text. I miss those days. I like 18th century internet. There's a, there's a guy I follow on uh, uh, Facebook who uh, he's got a whole business making like Civil War ammunition. Oh really? Because the the, the terms were, and the rifling is wrong? Huh? 
Oh, Reaper guns can't because they're not Swan made correctly. In the of 18, 30 north, 10 mile long and that seems odd that they would bother to make a reproduction that wasn't er, an actual themselves. reproduction. Here they thought they might align privately for some time and fit themselves for further mischief. Yeah, that's cool. I'd like to see that. But if you're going to go to the trouble of rifling a barrel and anybody who's producing them, I would assume, is setting up, you know, they're setting up for machining. Why wouldn't they duplicate what's there rather than inventing something new that won't take the actual stuff? That's weird. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, let me see if I can find it. I'll, I'll post the link to his, his page on Facebook. Um, Paper. Oh, uh, it's called paper cartridges. I think. Let's see. Is this the one? Yeah. Oh yeah, he's in Gettysburg. It's. Uh, copy. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, okay. I didn't know he had a YouTube channel. Let me check that out. Uh, that's kind of cool. And I, I don't do any Civil War stuff. I'm interested in it, but, it, you know, I, uh, I've got the energy and resources for Rev War. And slightly earlier, slightly later, but really I'm sort of stuck in the 1770s around, you know, within, say, 20 years, give or take. Um, Oh yeah, I'll subscribe to this guy. I didn't know that he had a had a channel. That's very cool. Scarborough of thirty guns and one hundred forty men to acquaint him that the two pirate sloops of twelve guns each molested the colonies. I think it's neat that he's got a got a got a business built around nineteenth century ammunition. I think that's cool. I love that there are so many people interested in old stuff that there are, you know, you know, websites and businesses and, you know, people we spend our weekends out in the field. I haven't been out, out. We have my wife and I haven't been able to get out maybe two years now, almost three, but Civil War back in the day, massive not political, yeah. Yeah, I've got friends, or I have over the years, had friends who do Revolutionary War and Civil War and, and stuff. Shoots and shows pros and cons. Yeah. That's very cool. That he saw a pirate ship of yeah, I'll have to. I want to check this. Uh, his website. He's got a lot of videos here. Holy cow! Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know about his web. His uh, YouTube channel. I don't even know how I came. I, I don't know how I came across his uh, Facebook thing, but uh, I started following him, I guess, last year. Um, oh, he just posted one uh, yesterday. Very cool. Yeah, really. On the twentieth, in the evening, they observed the man of war to stand off to sea and took the opportunity. Well, not only that, but the like the the resources you have. Like, there's a, a big Civil War show in Mansfield, Ohio, which is just north of the center of of the state. Um, and we go in there, and they they had like two tables of. Of Revolutionary War stuff, and it was, you know, it's reproductions, and maybe a couple of original things, but you know, the rest of the show is all like Gatling guns, and you can get original cartridge boxes, and you know, like you can still find original gear from the uh, from the Civil War, but Revolutionary War stuff is really hard to find. So you've got all the and plus by the you know 1860s, everybody's you know they're documenting stuff, and you know the country's. Pretty well established, and they've got got all their stuff 
written down and printed up and tallied and you got the blueprints for things revolutionary wars kind of like archaeology and sort of it's a lot of figuring stuff out I'm going to step away from just Chapter a minute three, and be right back. Part one of Cap sailed some time out of Jamaica in privateers in the late French War. Yet though he had often distinguished himself for his uncommon boldness and personal courage, he was never raised to any command until he went to pirating, which I think was at the latter end of the year 1716, when Captain Benjamin Hornigold put him into a sloop that he had made prize of, and with whom he continued in consortship till a little while before Hornigold surrendered. In the spring of the year 1717, Teach and Hornigold sailed from Providence for the Maine of America and took in their way a billet from the Havana with 120 barrels of flour, as also a sloop from Bermuda, their bar master, from whom they took only some gallons of wine and then let him go, and a ship from Madeira to South Carolina, out of which they got plunder to a considerable value. After cleaning on the coast of Virginia, they returned to the West Indies, and in the latitude of 24, made a prize of a large French guinea man bound to Martinico, which by Hornigold's consent, Teach went aboard of his captain and took a cruise in her. Hornigold returned with his sloop to Providence, where at the arrival of Captain Rogers, the governor, he surrendered to mercy, pursuant to the king's proclamation. Aboard of this guinea man, Teach mounted 40 guns, and named her the Queen Anne's Revenge. And cruising near the island of St. Vincent, took a large ship called the Allen, Christopher Taylor commander. The pirates plundered her of what they thought fit, put all the men ashore upon the island above mentioned, and then set fire to the ship, ashore in their boat. Oh, yeah. Teach's quartermaster and eight of his crew took Some possession of wire Okay, ship. cool, yeah, I'll check that Adventure out. secured all the sloops, one of which they burnt out of spite to the owner. The Protestant Caesar they also burnt, after they had plundered her, because she belonged to Boston, where some men had been hanged for piracy. And the three sloops belonging to Bernard they let go. From hence the rovers sailed to Turkill, and then to the Grand Caymans, a small island about 30 leagues to the westward of Jamaica, where they took a small turtler. And so to the Bahama wrecks, from the Bahama wrecks, they sailed to Carolina, taking a brigantine and two sloops in their way. So I had two people today tell me that these uh, remind them of the Shroud of Turin. These, uh, once I took the, the sewed um, skulls off, the ghosts left on there. Look like that, that ghostly image. I think they look kind of cool. I like them like this. Might be fun to paint some like this. I don't know if they ever painted them though. I think they uh, mostly the, I mean, the two examples that exist they stitched. So I'm gonna keep doing it this way. It just looks cool. I wouldn't have done anything to them except I, I took them out in the. Uh, oh, you know what? Let me, uh, do I have that video? It might be on my phone. If it's on my phone, then I can't. Let me take a look here. Maybe I... Oh, you know what? Yeah, I do, actually. Here. So, let me run this through OBS. And, uh... Let's see here. I want... How do I show a video? Bear with me for just a moment. I'm still learning how to do this. Uh, what I want to do is put... Add display capture. I guess I could do display capture, right? Image, image slideshow, media source. Let's try that. Media source, create new. You know what? The simplest way to do this is let me just show the display capture. Let's just do that. So this is going to show my screen, but let me move my camera down here. And hey, boys, I 
fucked uh, up. Oh, that's the old one. <laughs> okay, so this is what they looked like. I think you can see this. Yeah, so this is what they looked like when they were done. I was, I told my wife, I said, all right, I'm ready to ship this out, and we're done. And then later that day, I got cocky and thought, oh, you know, I'll, I'll give them just a little bit of weather. And then this is what they looked like after that, out in the sun. And, you know, if you step back from them, they're, uh, they were just so washed out that, you know, didn't do the, didn't do what I wanted it to do. But they do look cool. But they're they're just too they're not black flag enough. Like they, they were just so gray that um, nobody you know you figure you've got to be able to see them from at least a quarter mile away when you hoist the colors. So let me here reset this transform set the screen and uh, there we go. Yeah, and, and that's what I originally wanted, and I think. I think what happens is, like, this was what I wanted them to look like with the, you know, with the skulls and bones on them, but a little higher contrast. Um, but I really fell in love with them as they were crisp and black. And like my wife pointed out, she's like, you know, and, and we've been over this, you know, as, as we make stuff for reenacting. They didn't make old looking stuff in the 18th century. They made new stuff and you know, by the time it gets to us, you know, in modern times, then it then it looks old. But uh, I, I wanted them to have just a little bit of wear on them, and it just went too too deep, too far. And then when I tried to repair the the pink bones, it uh, yeah right. <laughs> when when I had the pink bones on there and I painted the bleach on, it didn't totally cure the problem. I mean, it helped, but. Um, but then I, you know, it bleached them, bleached the black out too much. So I wanted, um, it, so I think really it's just a matter of practice. Like these are the first flags I've ever made, the first pirate flags I've ever made. And I think with some more experience, now I have this experience, what I needed was um, about 15% of what I did to them. That might have done it, uh, but what I did was it was too much and then, you know, brought me here to this stage. Hello, little cat. Maybe water it down. Yeah, and and I'm just just going to use, well, yeah. That, that probably would have helped had I used less, less dye, and then it just, it just needed, I thought I, I only put a little bit in, and I thought I had the right amount, but it was just a little bit too much, and then it, Use a spray bottle? No, I uh, uh, did it in the washing machine. Um, and just really just put in, I don't know, maybe a teaspoon of, of the dye, but it was it was so intense and, and it just reddened so much that it, it changed, the, uh, changed the bones from white to pink. And what I wanted was, and maybe what I should have done is just soaked them in strong coffee. Because that's really what I wanted was that sort of coffee color, just, just a little bit tan. Let me show you what the original looked like. Um, the original flag, uh, it's really cool. Let's see here, video, pirate flag, right here. Um, we have, um, let me just bring this image up here, image. That's the original, which I, I think was really cool. Um, let's go back up to display capture, and then I can I can zoom in and show you. I'm gonna move the camera out of the way again. So we have. 
that, and then I want, um, where's the other one? There's one where they, they modified the color, so it's more like it might have been at the time. <clears throat> right, and so, I mean, this is more, way more bleached out. This was originally black, um, but it was faded out. Whoa, I don't know if you could hear that on there. One of my neighbors is shooting. <laughs> It's 12.30 in the morning. It's not that unusual, but surprising. Um, no, I should be looking at this. Anyhow, so this is the original. And, and I've done a close job of copying it. Their stitching is finer than mine, but not a whole lot. Um, but So that's the original. And then they had uh, somebody at the museum, I think, went, went in and darkened the stuff to show more like what it would have looked like originally. Go back to background image. Move that out of the way. There we go. So there's really bleached out, but that's over, you know, 200 and some years. Whereas now, you know, these are, they almost would be more visible if, if it had that, you know, if it was that all pale background, right? It, you, what you need is the contrast at distance. You don't, it, you know, I don't actually even care about the color, except they always talk about the black flag. In, in one of the, uh, at least one of the, uh, the stories in the general history of the pirates, they talk about how, uh, you know, they, they made a flag. I don't know if they used uh, parts of sails or whatever they, they had aboard, but they, they made their flag and then they went, when they, when, once they decided to become pirates, they, they made a flag and went out for adventure and depredation. Started on the. Uh, I'm making the reinforcing band for the. Let me see. If I can turn the camera a little bit over to the side. Um, I'm just doing the uh, the band uh, along the, the side of that, that long flag there. That is here. <clears throat> so I gotta trim this to size. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that you could actually go into a reputable tailor and say, you know, I'd like a, I'd like for you to make me a flag. Uh, sure, sir. What do you want it to look like? Well, it's black. We want a skull and bones on it. Oh, so you're a reputable businessman, huh? An honest trader, honest merchant. Just, yeah, that's what we're doing. I mean, maybe some ports he could, but I mean, what was the guy's name in, uh, was it the Carolinas? He, uh, actually, uh, this, we've just come to the part in the general history of the pirates where, uh, uh, the story she's telling now is about Edward Teach, alias Blackbeard. And, and he was in deep with the, uh, the governor, I think of North Carolina, who, I guess they, uh, they gave him good deals on things and, and the people around liked the pirates because you know they could buy buy things cheap This is Scout. She is our uh, she 
He's my new tent making and pirate flag making assistant. Last month, she, uh, my wife got home from the store sometime after dark and uh, heard this one crying outside. We'd never seen her before. But she uh, somehow was 10 feet up in this tree that we have out front. So we went out there with flashlights and we found her and brought her in just because it was cold. And then, uh, so she's she's been helping me sew all month. Did a paper on gentleman of the 18th century not part from parts? Oh yeah. And a lot of them, or at least some of them, uh, what's the guy's name? Steve Bonnet. He was a he was a gentleman in, uh, I think, in the Bahamas. <clears throat> and he went. I think what really happened is he went a little crazy. And I think the story that went out then though was that he was that his wife drove him nuts, and so he uh, he fitted out a he bought a ship, fitted it out, and went a pirating. And that's that's a that's a great story. It's a lot of fun. What made these misfortunes heavier to them was a long, expensive war the colony had had with the natives, which was but just ended when these robbers infested them. Teach detained all the ships and prisoners, and being in want of medicines, resolves to demand the chest from the government of the province. Accordingly, Richards, the captain of the Revenge Sloop, with two or three more pirates, were sent up along with Mr. Marks, one of the prisoners, whom they had taken in Clark's ship. Oh, gee. <laughs> made their yeah, we took her around. We took her down to the neighbors. We thought she came from one of the other farms around here, and nobody knew who she was. So that's how we've gotten all of our cats. We had, well, we had Ranger showed up when he was a kitten. He was a little. He he died this summer, um, but he showed up. No idea where he came from. Tried to get rid of him. Tried to scare him away for three days, and he didn't go away. So we we figured he had earned his place here, and. Turned out to be, uh, he was he was great, um, wonderful. And then uh, a couple years later, the other cat that we have, she's fully grown. She showed up and she was in miserable shape. She'd been hit by a coyote or something, or something terrible had happened to her. And she showed up and we got her, you know, got her fixed up and stuff. And she's she's still here and she's she's thriving. And then this one. Yeah, they they come when they when they need to. We and we've got some other like feral ones that you know live out in the woods. And it turns out our neighbor feeds them. So she down the down the way. I didn't know that until we tried to take these this one down there. She's like, no, I don't I don't have any cats. I don't like cats, but I feed them. So I mean, she puts things out for them out in the out in the woods. <clears throat> doing on this one's coming along pretty fast I accidentally got this one cut pretty straight so it's going easily send up their heads to the governor and set the ships they had taken on fire whilst Mr. Marks was making application to the council Richards and the rest of the pirates walked the streets publicly in the sight of all people who were fired with the utmost indignation looking upon them as robbers and murderers and particularly the authors of their wrongs and oppressions but durst not so much as think of executing their revenge for fear of bringing more calamities upon themselves. And so they were forced to let the villains pass with impunity. The government were not long in deliberating upon the message, though it was the greatest affront that could have been put upon them. Yet for the saving so many men's lives, among them Mr. Samuel Wragg, one of the council, they complied with the necessity and sent aboard a chest valued at between three and four hundred pounds, and the pirates went back safe to their ships. Blackbeard, for so Teach was generally called, as we shall hereafter show, as soon as he had received the medicines and his brother rogues, let go the ships and the prisoners, having first taken out of them in gold and silver about 1,500 pounds sterling, besides provisions and other matters. From the bar of Charlestown, they sailed to North Carolina. Captain Teach and the ship which they called the Man of War, Captain Richards and Captain Hands and the sloops, which they termed privateers, 
and another sloop serving them as a tender. Teach began now to think of breaking up the company and securing the money and the best of the effects for himself and some others of his companions he had most friendship for and to cheat the rest. Accordingly, on pretense of running into Topsail Inlet to clean, he grounded his ship, and then, as if it had been done undesignedly and by accident, he orders Hans' sloop to come to his assistance and get him off again, which he, endeavoring to do, ran the sloop on shore near the other, and so were both lost. This done, Teach goes into the tender sloop with forty hands and leaves the revenge there, then takes seventeen others and maroons them upon a small sandy island about a league from the main, where there was neither bird, beast, or herb for their subsistence, and where they must have perished if Major Bonnet had not, two days later, taken them off. Teach goes up to the governor of North Carolina with about twenty of his men, surrenders to his majesty's proclamation, and receives certificates thereof from his excellency. But it did not appear that their submitting to this pardon was from any reformation of manners, but only to wait a more favorable opportunity to play the same game over again which he soon after effected with greater security to himself and with much better prospect of success, having in this time cultivated a very good understanding with Charles Eden Esquire, the governor above mentioned. That's the the first piece of service this kind governor did to Blackbeard was to give him a right to the vessel which he had taken when he was a pirating in the great ship called Queen Anne's Revenge, for which purpose a court of vice admiralty was held at Bath Town, and though Teach had never any commission in his life, and the sloop belonging to the English merchants, and taken in time of peace, yet was she condemned as a prize taken from the Spaniards by the said teach. These proceedings show that governors are but men. Before he sailed upon his adventures, he married a young teacher of about 16 years of age. The governor oh, yeah, I, the ceremony. I've seen a couple of those like that. custom to marry here by a priest, so it is there by a magistrate. And this, I have been informed, may teach his 14th wife, whereof about a dozen might still be living. All right. His behavior in this state was something extraordinary, for while his sloop lay in Ocracoke Inlet, and he assured a plantation where his wife lived, with whom after he had lain all night, it was his custom to invite five or six of his brutal companions to come ashore, and he would force her to prostitute herself to them all, one after another, before his face. In June 1718, he went to sea upon another expedition and steered his course toward Bermuda. Right. What's he met next? with two or three English vessels in his way, but brought them only of provisions, stores, and other necessities for his present expense. I have that piece but near right. the island aforementioned, he fell in with two French ships. Oh, okay, One of them was loaded with sugar and cocoa, and the other light, both bound to Martinico. The ship that had no lading, he let go, oh, I need to do putting it. all the men of the loaded ship mm-hmm. aboard her. He All brought home the other with their cargo to North Carolina, where the governor and the pirates shared the plunder. When Teach and his prize arrived, he and four of his crew height. went to his excellency and made affidavit and that they found the French six, ship at sea sides. without a soul on board her. And then a court was called and the ship condemned. The governor had sixty hogsheads of sugar for his dividend, and one Mr. Knight, who was his secretary and collector for the province, twenty, and the rest was shared among the other pirates. Oh, really? The business was not yet done. The ship remained. Did they have him in a museum? One or other might come into the... I remember reading a couple of years ago that they had found it. Oh, wow. Let me look that up. That's pretty awesome. Queen Anne's Revenge. That's neat. Oh, there's a there's a big rabbit hole here. I, I can see myself falling down in all these uh, videos. Displayed in a steakhouse. Oh, how cool.
Blackbeard's Triple Play Restaurant, New Bern. Blackbeard's Pirate Days. Blackbeard's in Jacksonville. Wonder if this guy had any idea he was how much money he was making for people 300 years later. Oh, the North Carolina Maritime Museum at Beaufort in New Newburn.com. Okay. Do they have a website for the, that, or is it just the city? Let's see here. Let me uh, bring up my screen. You can see what I'm looking at. Look at these outboards. Jeez, they're huge. I don't know what this museum is. It looks great. That's really cool. It's a nice looking museum. The Watercraft Center. I've never really spent any time in South Carolina. Is that North Carolina? New Bern, North. Is that North or South? North Carolina. I've never. I mean, I've been through there. I've driven by there, but that's very cool. Let's see what do we have here. Yeah, this triple play restaurant really has got all the uh, search results. Oh, that's neat. Let's see here. Um, New Bern, Blackbeard. Let's see if we can find anything from Queen Anne's Revenge. There we go. QAR Online. Discovery near Beaufort Inlet in 96. Remains of the. Hmm. Sea artifacts. Yes, please. That's cool. Oh, wow. Okay. That is pretty neat. Let's see here. What are the... Oh, man, they have a big catalog here. They got pipes and gold dust and. Very cool. Oh boy. <laughs> Bar shot. Oh, that's cool. Look at that. Hmm. They were still loaded when she sank. That's neat. Grenades. How oh, cool. Wow. Hmm. Oh, that's really neat. I'm gonna have to check this out. <clears throat> oh, they found the bell? Storage ships components, right? Oh, look at that. Okay. Yeah, look at this. It's starting to look professional now. Dated 1705. 
captured a Spanish sloop off the coast of Cuba. Oh, there's no photo here. Well, we have a picture here, though. That's pretty neat. Oh, C to V's. We need that, of course. Journals, sail fragments. Wow. Dude, that's awesome. What are these for? Draft marks along the side of the ship and the bow and stern cut from sheet lead. Oh, that's neat. Very cool. All right. That's awesome. Hmm. That's really cool. That's amazing. You, you see this, you, you hear these stories, or you read the books, and then you see these things, and it, it just it just makes it real. That is very cool. Who, within a year after that time, 
should take or destroy any pirate. The original proclamation being in our hands is as follows. By His Majesty's Lieutenant Governor and Commander-in-Chief of the Colony and Dominion of Virginia, a proclamation publishing the rewards given for apprehending or killing pirates. Whereas, by an act of assembly, made at a session of assembly begun at the Capitol in Williamsburg, the 11th day of November, in the fifth year of His Majesty's reign, entitled, An Act to Encourage the Apprehending and Destroying of Pirates. It is, amongst other things enacted, that all and every person or persons who, from and after the 14th day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1,718, and before the 14th day of November, yeah, which shall be in the year of our Lord, 1,719, yeah. shall take any watch. pirate or pirates on the sea or land, <laughs> or in case of resistance, shall kill any such pirate or yeah. pirates between the degrees of 34 and 39 of northern latitude, and within 100 leagues of the continent of Virginia, or within the provinces of Virginia or North Carolina, upon the conviction or making due proof of the killing of all and every such pirate and pirates before the governor and no. council shall be entitled to have and receive out of the public money in the hands of the treasurer of this colony the several rewards following. That is to say, for Edward Teach, commonly called Captain Teach, or Blackbeard, 100 pounds. For every other commander of a pirate ship, sloop, or vessel, 40 pounds. For every lieutenant, master, or quartermaster, Bosun or Carpenter, 20 pounds. For every other inferior officer, 15 pounds. And for every private man taken on board such ship, sloop, or vessel, 10 pounds. And that for every pirate, which shall be taken by any ship, sloop, or vessel belonging to this colony or North Carolina, hmm. within the time aforesaid, in any place whatsoever, the like rewards shall be paid according to the yeah, quality and condition of such pirates. Wherefore, for the encouragement of all such persons as shall be willing to serve His Majesty and their country in so just and honorable an undertaking as the suppressing a sort of people who may be truly called enemies to mankind, I have not said with the general. advice and consent of His Majesty's enemies Council mankind. to issue this proclamation, hereby declaring the said rewards shall be punctually and justly paid in current money of Virginia according to the directions of said act. And I do order and appoint this proclamation to be published by the sheriffs at their respective county houses, and by all ministers and readers in the several churches and chapels throughout this colony. Given at our council chamber at Williamsburg, this 24th day of November, 1718, in the fifth year of His Majesty's reign. God save the King. A. Spotswood. Hmm. End of chapter 3, part 1. If you go to uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, they have the jail where some of these guys were kept. Chapter were 3, captured. Part 2 of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. Have you ever been down this there a to uh, Williamsburg? All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rain. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson. Chapter 3, Part 2 The 17th of November, 1718, oh. the lieutenant sailed from King well worth in trip. James River, Virginia, and the 21st in the evening well came worth to the mouth of Coke Inlet, Wonderful. where he got sight of the pirates. <clears throat> this expedition was made with all imaginable secrecy, and the officer managed with all the prudence that was necessary, stopping all boats and vessels he met with in the river from going it's, up. Uh, it's maybe one of the, I think... Any intelligence from reaching Blackbeard and receiving at the same time yeah, everywhere around it, yeah, yeah, Norfolk the and place where the pirate was lurking. Jamestown. But notwithstanding this caution, Blackbeard had information yeah, designed is, for his excellency a, a, maybe one of the best museums in America. And the secretary, Mr. Knight, wrote him a letter particularly concerning it, intimating that he it's had not sent the four of his men, which were all he could meet with in or about town, and so bid him be upon his guard. These men belonged to Blackbeard and were sent from Bath Town to Ocracoke Inlet, where the sloop lay which is about 20 leagues. Blackbeard oh, heard yeah, several yeah. reports, nice. which happened not to be true, okay. and so gave the less credit to this. Nor was he convinced till he saw the sloops, whereupon he put his vessel in a posture of defense. He had no more than 25 men on board, though he gave out to all the vessels he spoke with that he had 40. Uh, think about when he had prepared for battle, he sat down and spent the night in drinking with the master of a trading sloop, 
Pooch was thought had more business with Teach than he should have had. <laughs> Lieutenant Maynard came to an anchor, for the place being shoal and the channel intricate, there was no getting in where Teach lay that night. But in the morning he weighed and sent his boat ahead of the sloops to sound, and coming within gunshot of the pirate received his fire, whereupon Maynard hoisted the king's colors and stood directly towards him, with the best way that his sails and oars could make. Blackbeard cut his cable and endeavored to make a running fight, keeping a continual fire at his enemies with his guns. Mr. Maynard, not having any, kept a constant fire with small arms, while some of his men labored at their oars. In a little time, Teach's sloop ran aground, and Mr. Maynard's drawing more water than that of the pirate, he could not come near him. So he anchored within half gunshot of the enemy, and in order to lighten his vessel that he might run him aboard, the lieutenant ordered Never been there. all the ballast to be Where is that? overboard, and all the water to be saved, and then weighed and stood for him, upon which Blackbeard hailed him in this rude manner. Damn you for villains, who are you? And from whence came you? The lieutenant made him answer, you may see by our colors we are New no Zealand pirates. Marine Corps. Blackbeard bid him send his boat on board that he might see who he was. But Maynard replied thus, I cannot spare my boat, but I will come aboard of you as soon as I can with my sloop. Hmm. Upon this, Blackbeard took a glass of liquor and drank to him with these words, Damnation seize my soul if I give you quarters or take any from you. <sighs> In answer to which, Mr. Maynard told him oh, he? that he expected no quarters from him, nor should he give any. By this time, Blackbeard sloop fleet. The other, incidentally, just uh, about this bit that she just talked about. The other existing pirate flag that's been captured is in. Uh, it's somewhere. It's at the, I think, the National Maritime Museum in London, or maybe the uh, National Museum of the the Royal Navy in London. It's on loan. Captured off the north coast of Africa from the Barbary pirates. It's a. In fact, I'm going to show you just because it's cool. She's talking about Blackbeard and and uh, Maynard or going back and forth about you know, uh, you know. I expect no quarter and I'll give none. This is the uh, you know the red the red ensign was uh, the sign of no quarter. You know, that's what this flag is. Let me see if I can let me bring this up for you just because it's cool. So there are two pirate flags that exist. One looks kind of like that. And the other one is a red field with a skull and bones on it. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Let's see here. If we can, let me get my camera out of the way. Um, you know, you see me, you see the pirate flag. Let's make this bigger. Pretty rad, huh? That's wool. So, no quarter. So I imagine they uh, sail into battle playing no, Ze no quarter from Zeppelin, flying these colors, and uh, slashing and burning across the sea. I, I think I want to make this one, too. The reason I did, I was initially going to make this one, I have some red wool, um, but I couldn't, well, two things. One, I didn't like the fact that it's uh, the reinforcing is across the top. They uh, apparently they flew this from one of the spars. Uh, but the other thing was the uh, I, I couldn't find any better resolution picture than this. Like the one thing I liked about the uh, the one I'm doing is the uh, there, you know, it's really crisp. You can see all the stitches. I thought that was pretty uh, pretty red. Transform. Bit screen. Is it bunting? I, I think it's it's woven uh, wool. Oh, I can't imagine how much they'd be in, insured for. I mean, I mean, considering that there are only just just doing this is only based on Google searches. Uh, there are three flags that exist. One's in Saint Augustine, but it's like an 1850 flag, and these two from the 18th century. I mean, I, I can't imagine. With what their what their value would be, it's got it. I don't know. I'd say it's probably hundreds of thousands of dollars just because. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, it should be priceless, right? But but maybe it's it's several hundred thousand dollars. 
but there are only like three of them two really two real pirate flags and none from the the golden age of piracy that i know of and these are all like this i think this one the red one was captured in like 1780 um and uh the other one is they just say late 18th century I, I, I want to make this one just because I like this design. It, it actually, though, it reminds me kind of of the, uh, the, the German, um, uh, what, what do they call it, the uh, Totenkopf symbol of the SS. So it's it that kind of squashed down skull on the, uh, on the bones. Maybe that's where they got their design idea. Not sure. I am ready, I think, to cut these down to size and get them attached. So that's the next phase, new wave. Oh, the Dragoons, yeah, that's right. I've seen those. <clears throat> that might be interesting to go look at all of the, uh, the uses of skull and, skull and crossbones in uh, military and piracy and stuff. And see how the designs changed over time, because you can you can kind of tell a uh, an 18th century design and a 20th century and you know 19th. There's something about it that's just I mean that's it's a hell of a design. It's it's pretty cool. I mean, if it's designed to uh, to intimidate or uh, you know break their will to fight, it, you can't get much better than this. Oh, did you? Facts that they discovered in the. Uh... Oh, well, really? Like, uh... hmm. She's talking about the uh, new fashion Granados. And that's one of the things that we saw. Let me bring that back up. One of the things that we saw. What was the name of that? It's uh, New Baron Black Beard. Artifacts. That's one of the things that they found in the Queen Anne's Revenge, right?
Yeah, right there. Drone on board generally does great execution. Besides putting all the crew into a line, this could not be helped, for there being no wind, they were obliged to keep to their oars. Otherwise, the pirate would have gotten away from him, which it seems the lieutenant was resolute to prevent. After this unlucky blow, Blackbeard's sloop fell broadside to the shore. Mr. Maynard's other sloop, which was called the Ranger, fell astern, being for the present disabled. So the lieutenant, finding his own sloop had way, and would soon be on First board of Teach, he ordered all his men down for fear of another broadside, which must have been their destruction and the loss of their expedition. Mr. Maynard was the only person that kept the deck, except the man at the helm, whom he directed to lie down snug. And the men in the hold were ordered to get their pistols and their swords ready for close fighting, and to come up at his command. In order to which, two ladders were placed in the hatchway for the more expedition. Yeah, that first page when actually had a better picture. The other, this Captain one. Teach's men threw in several new-fashioned sort of granados. These case That's bottles, amazing. filled with powder and small shot, slugs and pieces of lead or iron, with a quick match in the mouth of it, which being lighted from outside, presently runs into the bottle to the powder, and as it is instantly thrown on board, generally does great execution. So this, this book written 300 years ago is now read to us you know, via the computer. We're talking about it over the internet. None of that they could have imagined. But here we are with that new fashion Granado. That's, that's a, I'm just constantly amazed. And therefore, says he, let's jump on board and cut them to pieces. Whereupon, under the smoke of one of the bottles just mentioned, Blackbeard enters with 14 men over the bows of Maynard's sloop and were not seen by him till the air cleared. However, he just then gave a signal to his men, who all rose in an instant and attacked the pirates with as much bravery as ever was done upon such an occasion. Blackbeard and the lieutenant fired the first pistol at each other, by which the pirate received a wound, and then engaged with the swords, till the lieutenant unluckily broke, and stepping back to cock a pistol, Blackbeard with his cutlass was striking at that instant, that one of Maynard's men gave him a terrible wound in the neck and throat by which the lieutenant came off with a small cut over his fingers. They were now closely and warmly engaged, the lieutenant and twelve men against Blackbeard and fourteen, till the sea was tinctured yeah. with blood round the vessel. Blackbeard received a shot into his body from the pistol that Lieutenant Maynard discharged, yet he stood his ground and fought with great fury, till he received five and twenty wounds, and five of them by shot. At length, as he was cocking another pistol, having fired... And it's always amazing four, how well it lines up. By which time, eight more... You know, a lot of times you, you look at old paintings or read old reports, wounded, and, and called out for quarters, I used to at least imagine, well, well they were they were a little sketchy. A few days. But so often, a it's just as described. The remained in Blackbeard's sloop with equal bravery, till they likewise cried for quarters. Here was an end of that courageous brute who might have passed in the world for a hero, had he been employed in a good cause. His destruction, which was of such consequence to the plantations, was entirely owing to the conduct and bravery of Lieutenant Maynard and his men, who might have destroyed him with much less loss had they had a vessel with great guns. But they were obliged to use small vessels because the holes and places he lurked in would not admit of others of greater draft. And it was no small difficulty for this gentleman to get to him, having grounded his vessel at least a hundred times in getting up the river, besides other discouragements, enough to have turned back any gentleman without dishonor who was less resolute and bold than this must have been a hell of a trip. The broadside that did so much mischief before they boarded, in all probability, saved the rest from destruction. For before that, Teach had little or no hopes of escaping, and therefore had posted a resolute fellow, a negro whom he had bred up, with a lighted match in the powder room, with commands to blow up when he should give him orders, which was as soon as the lieutenant and his men could have entered, that so he might have destroyed his conquerors. And when the Negro found out how it went with Blackbeard, he could hardly be persuaded from the rash action by two prisoners that were then in the hold of the sloop. Hmm. What seems a little odd is that some of these men, who behaved so bravely right. against Blackbeard, went oh, afterwards man. a pirating themselves. And what... I, uh, I transcribed the, the journal of the public store at Williamsburg and maybe a thousand times I said, could you have at least written down the color? Would it have killed you? I know there's a war on and you guys are busy, and, 
but could you could you just describe this a little bit more accurately just just a little bit more detail like tell us where you got this or what it's for yeah I was taken along with Roberts but I do not find that any of them were provided for except one that was hanged but this is a digression the lieutenant caused Blackbeard's head to be severed from his body and hung up at the bolt's right end then he sailed to Bathtown to get relief for his wounded men it must be observed that these are ready to iron I'm going to get to it 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 I'm going to get to it
In the Commonwealth of Pirates, he who goes the greatest length of wickedness is looked upon with a kind of envy amongst them, as a person of a more extraordinary gallantry, and is thereby entitled to be distinguished by some post, and if such a one has but courage, he must certainly be a great man. The hero of whom we are writing was thoroughly accomplished this way, and some of his frolics of wickedness were so extravagant, as if he aimed at making his men believe he was a devil incarnate. For being one day at sea, and a little flushed with drink, Come, says he, let us make a hell of our own, and try how long we can bear it. Accordingly, he, with two or three others, went down into the hold, and closing up all the hatches, filled several pots full of brimstone and other combustible matter, and set it on fire, and so continued till they were almost suffocated, when some is of the men cried it? out for air. At length he opened the hatches, not a little pleased that he held out the longest. The night before he was killed, he sat up and drank till the morning with some of his own men and the master of a merchantman, and having had intelligence of the two sloops coming to attack him, as has before been observed. One of his men asked him, in case anything should happen to him in the engagement with the sloops, whether his wife knew where he had buried his money. He answered that nobody but himself and the devil knew where it was, and the longest liver should take all. Well, Those of his crew who were taken alive told a story which may appear a little incredible. However, we think it will not be fair to omit it since we had it from their own mouths. That once upon a cruise, they found out they had a man on board more than their crew. Such a one was seen several days amongst them, sometimes below and sometimes upon deck. Those and no stories. man on the ship could give an account who he was or from whence he came. But that he disappeared a little before they were cast away in their great ship. But it seems they verily believed it was the devil. One would think these things should induce them to reform their lives, but so many reprobates together encouraged and spirited one another up in their wickedness, to which a continual course of drinking did not a little contribute. For in Blackbeard's journal, which was taken, there were several memorandums of the following nature, found writ with his own hand. Such a day, rum all out. Our company somewhat sober. A damn confusion amongst us. Rogues applauding. Great talk of separation. So I looked sharp for a prize. Such a day took one with a great deal of liquor on board, so kept the company hot, damned hot, that all things went well again. Thus it was these wretches passed their lives with very little pleasure or satisfaction in the possession of what they violently take away from others, and sure to pay for it at last by an ignominious death. The names of the pirates killed in the engagement are as follow. Edward Teach, Commander. Philip Morton, Gunner. Garrett Gibbons, Boson. Owen Roberts, Carpenter. Thomas Miller, Quartermaster. John Husk. Joseph Curtis. Joseph Brooks. Nathaniel Jackson. All the rest, except the two last, were wounded and afterwards hanged in Virginia. John Carnes. Joseph Brooks, James Blake, John Gills, Thomas Gates, James White, Richard Stiles, Caesar, Joseph Phillips, James Robin, John Martin, Edward Salter, okay, there's our Stephen reinforcement Daniel, band. Richard Greensand, ready to go on. Israel so Hans, pardon. Once I get the, Samuel I'm gonna, this is for Clinton. this one, once I get it. There this time, then this goes on. It's ready to go. I don't have to do anything to it until then. Let me put this up in the chair over here. 11 pieces of sugar, 11 pieces of sugar, 45 bags of cocoa, a barrel of indigo, and a bale of cotton, which, with what was taken from the governor and secretary, and the sale of the sugar, came to 2,500 pounds, besides the rewards paid by the governor of Virginia, pursuant to his proclamation, all which was divided among the companies of the two ships, Lime and Pearl, that lay in James River, the brave fellows that took them coming in for no more than their dividend amongst the rest, and was paid it within these three months. End oh, of chapter three, this. part two. We need to think about this for a minute. Chapter four, part one, section nine of The General History of the Pirates, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson. 
Chapter four, this part is one. the of major well, this is the new one, and it doesn't have crew. This is for the major was a gentleman of good reputation. This is the, the island of Barbados, final one. was master of a plentiful these. fortune and had the advantage right? of a liberal education. He had the least temptation of any man to follow such a course of life from the condition of his circumstances. It was very surprising to everyone to hear of the major's enterprise in the island where he lived, and as he was generally esteemed and honored before he broke out into open acts of piracy. Yeah. So he was afterwards rather pitied than condemned by those that were acquainted with him, believing that this humor of going on pirating proceeded from a disorder in his mind which had been but too visible in him sometime before this wicked undertaking. And he went crazy and became a pirate. Occasioned by some discomforts he found in a married state. Be that as it will, the major His was wife made him become a pirate. Business as not understanding maritime affairs. However, he fitted out a sloop with 10 guns and 70 men entirely at his own expense. And in the nighttime sailed from Barbados. 70 men and 10 guns. He called his sloop the Revenge. His first cruise was off the Capes of Virginia, where he took several ships and plundered them of their provisions, clothes, money, ammunition, etc. In particular, the Anne, Captain Montgomery from Glasgow. The turbot from Barbados, which, for country's sake, after they had taken out the principal part of the lady, the pirate crew set her on fire. Jerks. The Endeavor, Captain Scott from Bristol, and the Young from Leith. From hence they went to New York and off the east end of Long Island, took a sloop bound for the West Indies, after which they stood in and landed some men at Gardner's Island, but in a peaceable manner, and bought provisions for the company's use, which they paid for and so went off again without molestation. Sometime after, which was in August 1717, Bonnet came off the bar of South Carolina and took a sloop and a brigantine bound in. The sloop belonged to Barbados, Joseph Palmer, master laden with rum, sugar, and negroes. And the brigantine came from New England to Thomas Porter, master whom they plundered, and then dismissed. But they sailed away with the sloop, and had an inlet in North Carolina careened by her, and then set her on fire. Again, stop After burning this, these boats. I want to see them. To sea, but came to no resolution. At least just to sink them so we can the crew find them. In their opinions of some being for one thing and some another, so that nothing but confusion seemed to attend all their schemes. The major was no sailor, as was said before, and therefore had been obliged to yield to many things that were imposed on him during their undertaking for want of a competent knowledge in maritime affairs. You know, I could cut At length, happening to fall in company with another pirate, one Edward Teach. It's not far off. For his remarkable black, ugly beard was more commonly called Blackbeard. Hmm. This fellow was you a good sailor, but a most cruel, hardened, cunning, bold, and daring to the last degree, and would not stick at the perpetrating of the most abominable wickedness imaginable, for which he was made chief of the execrable gang, that it might be said that his post was not unduly filled. Blackbeard being truly the superior in roguery of all the company, as has been already related. To him, Bonnet's crew joined in consortship, and Bonnet himself was laid aside, notwithstanding the sloop was his own. He went aboard Blackbeard's ship, not concerning himself with any of their affairs, where he continued until she was lost in Topsail Inlet, and one Richards was appointed captain in his room. The Major now saw his folly, but could not help himself which made him melancholy. He reflected upon his past course of life and was confounded with shame when he thought upon what he had done. His behavior was taken notice of by the other pirates, who liked him never the better for it, and he often declared to some of them that he would gladly leave off that way of living, being fully tired of it, but he should be ashamed to see the face of any Englishman again. Therefore, if he could get to Spain or Portugal, where he might be undiscovered, he would spend the remainder of his days in either of those countries. Otherwise, he must continue with them as long as he lived. When Blackbeard lost his ship at Topsail Inlet and surrendered to the King's proclamation, Bonnet reassumed the command of his own sloop, Revenge, goes directly away to Bath Town in North Carolina, surrenders likewise to the King's pardon, and receives a certificate. The war was now broken out between the Triple Allies and Spain, so... Major Bonnet gets a clearance for his sloop at North Carolina to go to the island of St. Thomas with a desire.
designed, at least it was pretended so, to get the Emperor's commission to go a privateering upon the Spaniard. When Bonnet came back to Topsail Inlet, he found that Teach and his gang were gone, and that had taken all the money, small arms, and effects of value out of the great ship, and set ashore on a small sandy island above a league from the main, seventeen men, no doubt with a design they should perish, no inhabitant or provisions to subsist with all, okay. nor any boat or materials to build or make any kind of launch or vessel to escape from that desolate place. They remained there two nights and one day without subsistence, or the least prospect of any, expecting nothing else but a lingering death, when to their inexpressible comfort they saw a redemption at hand, for Major Bonnet happening to get intelligence of their being there by two of the pirates who had escaped Teach's cruelty and had got to a poor little village at the upper end of the harbor, sent his boat to make discovery of the truth of the matter, which the poor wretches seeing made a signal to them, and they were all brought on board Bonnet's sloop. Major Bonnet told all his company that he would take a commission to go against the Spaniard, and to that end was going to St. Thomas. Therefore, if they would go with him, they should be welcome. Whereupon they all consented, but as the sloop was preparing to sail, a bomb boat that brought apples and cider to sell to the sloop's men informed them that Captain Teach lay at Ocracoke Inlet with only 18 or 20 hands. Bonnet, who bore him a mortal hatred for some insults offered him, went immediately in pursuit of Blackbeard, but it happened too late, for he missed of him there, and after four days' cruise, hearing no further news of it, they steered their course towards Virginia. In the month of July, these adventurers came off the capes, and meeting with a pink with a stock of provisions on board, which they happened to be in want of, they took out of her ten or twelve barrels of pork and about four hundred weight of bread, but because they would not have this set down to the account of piracy, they gave them eight or ten casks of rice and an old cable in New Vero. Yeah, sounds fair. Two days afterwards, they chased a sloop of sixty ton and took her two leagues off of Cape Henry. They were so happy here as to get a supply of liquor to their victuals, for they brought from her two hogsheads of rum and as many of molasses, which it seems they had need of, though they had not ready money to purchase them. What security they intended to give, I can't tell. All right, GG. Good night, man. So I'm really glad you, uh, you hung out. It was uh, really enjoyed. Uh, really enjoyed chatting with you. All right, we're back. Got coffee, and I can remove that now. Put this up here. We can see what we're looking at. I should probably restore the flags. It's been three hours. It's 1.50. No, it should be about four hours. I think I'm going to uh, stop and restart the stream just to make it easier to edit because I want to chop these down into uh, like a 10 or 20 minute video that will help people if they ever need to repair a project. So I'm going to end the stream and then immediately restart it. I see one watching now. I don't know if that's me using my monitor or if that's uh, another person, but. Um, if it is another person, I apologize for cutting you off, but same channel, Muralist1 on YouTube. Um, if you like what you see, please subscribe, hit like, make a comment. But I will be back on within five minutes, probably two minutes, but I'm just going to restart real quick and be right back. <laughs> 